Well, good morning, everyone. We're going to get started here. <coughs> and uh, first, I'll turn to our executive director to see if there are any announcements to get us going. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman and council members. Um, this is day last. Uh, good work this week so far, everybody. Um, we do have a light agenda today. Uh, a few questions uh, that should come up, but uh, other than that, Mr. Chairman, I do not have any uh, any remarks for you this morning. All right, thank you. Let me see before we get started if there are any remarks from the audience from the from the council here. Uh, Heather Hall. Good morning, Chair Grilnick. Uh, good morning, everybody. I um, would like to. Uh, start this morning, if we could, by revisiting uh, agenda item G5. Okay. In order to do that, we would uh, do you have a motion in that regard. I do have a motion. I move that we reconsider action under G5. Okay, the language on the screen is accurate. I'll yes, look for it is. a second. Seconded by Butch Smith. Please speak your motion as necessary. Um, yes, thank you. I have a, another motion that I'll speak to. I think we're, the idea here is to just offer um, some streamlining of the action that was taken yesterday. Uh, and I can talk about that in the second a motion. A second. All right. Well, Let sure. me just see if there are any um, any discussion. I don't imagine there is, but I want to give folks an opportunity. I'm not seeing any hands, so I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Same. That motion passes unanimously. That transports us into agenda, back into agenda item G5. And because Vice Chair Hassemer had the gavel for that, I'll hand him the gavel for the re any further action you wish to be taken here. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Anderson. I, I may have been hearing things, but I thought I heard someone abstain. But it may, it may be my ears. Um, well, if we should get that on the record, if that's the case, did someone abstain from this motion? That, that's correct. Yeah, just a sound check. This is Caroline McKnight. Caroline abstained? That is correct. Okay, very good. Thank you. All right. I think the gavel is in my hands on this agenda item then. We're not going to... Uh, do an overview, but I will talk, turn to Ms. Heather Hall and uh, let her take the floor first. Thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer. Um I do have another uh, motion to amend the motion from G5 yesterday. Thank you very much, Sandra. I move that we amend the motion as follows. In number one, strike out alternative two and replace with new QP alternative. Strike out number two and replace with add to new QP alternative, the expiration option described under the new alternative section in agenda item G5A, supplemental gap report two. To number three, add and remove alternative two from the range of alternatives. Thank you. Uh, I would ask Sandra to please scroll to the top. Multiple 
And yes, my first question is, is it clear to council members which motion this refers to? Because we have multiple motions that were made and addressed through the course of this action. And so I'll, first question. Okay. Thank you, Vice Chair. And I should have provided a little bit more um, about that before I started in on the motion, but this is this is a change to the alternative that um, Phil brought forward yesterday. And um, so this is specific to that, the Anderson motion from yesterday. Thank you. And as you read through it, I do not believe I heard you read what's on our screen in front of us, parts one, two, and three. Is that specifically referencing what was done yesterday? That's exactly right. And so yes. that could be struck. And your motion is the, I'll just say the different font below. I just want I, to make sure we. Yeah, I I wouldn't strike the entire thing because the motion really in the language in the different font just changes certain parts of one, two, and three. So there's some parts of that original motion that need to to remain. Okay. Then let me. There, I think Sandra's going to show it as the new motion describes it. I will consider this. You are working on your motion to make sure it is displayed correctly. Thank you. Vice Chair Hasmer. Yes. Um, as a suggestion, another way to approach this would be to, um, in the where it starts in number one strikeout. Before that, it could say referencing the language above. Okay. Um, so we may have moved far enough along in this approach that that's okay. Are we? So, Heather, would you <coughs> please uh, take a minute and review that? In number one, um, Sandra, could you delete? after add, delete two, and replace, or replace two with A. Yes, Jesse. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, Ms. Hall, so the quota pound alternative was already moved as a part of a second, a separate motion. So this would, uh, I think, too, might be appropriate because you're adding to the motion that was uh, the first one that was adopted by Mr. Anderson. Thank you. 
So since we've shown the motion now with the strike through approach, I think we could remove, if you scroll down, the remaining language that was there. Is that? I, I just want to make sure, because I will ask you to reread your Perfect. motion. Okay. And as you work on this, I want to make sure when you're yeah. ready to do that, it's correct. Okay, thank you. I think you can get rid of everything of all the everything below. Yeah. Just read what's there. Okay. I'm ready to read the, the motion as as edited. All right, please go ahead. Okay. Right. Add to, Just okay. I move that we amend the Anderson motion as follows. One, add to new quota pound alternative, a sub option to qualify as a legacy participant, you must have landed 30,000 pounds in each of three years prior to the control date, owned quota share as of and since the control date, and owned a vessel that gear switched as of and since the control date. Add to new quota pound alternative, the expiration option described under the new alternative, section in agenda item G5A, supplemental gap report two, and three, suspend further analytical work on alternative three and remove alternative two from the range of alternatives. And I wanna make sure then, are you striking everything after that? Yes. So then it could, before maybe deleting all the um, the language below the motion, one, two, and three, just confirm with staff that that's clear to them. Mr. Vice Chair, Ms. Hall, yes, that is clear and I, I think would um, cover what we would need. Thank you. So Sandra, if you could remove the um, language under that starts with in number one. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Let's get it all up there as best we can. Sandra, I think above the number one, if there's just a, a line break there, you can delete the might all appear on the screen. There. All right, now I will ask, is the language on the screen accurate and as you intend? Yes, it is. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Butch Smith. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. And thanks everyone for your patience getting this just right. I after thinking about the motion yesterday and talking with folks and thinking about um, what was in gap report number two on under this agenda item, this motion would remove alternative two from the range, but it would incorporate provisions from alternative three that are related to qualification and expiration. Um, into the new quota pound alternative brought forth by Mr. Anderson yesterday. This would maintain the range of approaches for all alternatives using quota share and quota pounds 
a seasonal approach that would maintain consideration of quota share, vessel and permit history in establishing gear switching opportunity and would uh, reduce the workload for the analysts and reduce the amount of information that council members and stakeholders would need to understand the alternatives. So really just uh, streamlining where we ended up yesterday and, and cleaning up a bit. Um, so to help us all out in June. Thank you. Are there questions for the maker of the motion for clarification? I don't see any questions, discussion on the motion. Mr. Phil Anderson. Thanks, Mr. Vice Chair. Just re speak briefly in favor of the, um, the amendment uh, to the motion from yesterday. Uh, I think Heather did a great job of explaining the rationale behind it. I think it helps uh, reduce workload. I think it reduces the number of alternatives, which I think is a benefit to both the public as well as to all of us around the table. And as Heather mentioned, maintains a quota share approach, quota pound approach, and the approach that was uh, contained in the motion that uh, Krista Svensson brought forward that was approved. So I think it gives us a good range and uh, tries to streamline as much as possible a complex issue. Thanks. Thank you. Further discussion? I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, oh sorry. Lynn Mattis. Thank you, Vice Chair. I was a little slow on to get the hand up. Um, I, I'm supportive of this as I think it gets us where we need to go, where we're trying to get to. Uh, I do have some concerns about the process. Both the GAP and the GMT have been adjourned for a day and a half and have not had a chance to discuss this. I do think it's in line with what the GAP was trying to get at. Um, additionally, public was not aware that this would be coming back to us and may have not have had a, a chance to fully review. So just wanted to point out a process issue, but in, I am supportive of this as I think it's in line with the GAP recommendation and with what we heard in a lot of public comment yesterday. And I appreciate uh, the Washington folks working on this to try to get us to a better place. Thank you, and, and I guess I, I would take this uh, opportunity since I hold a gavel that uh, we understand your concerns, but if this were done under our normal process, under council discussion and action, that um, uh, it would not go back to the GAP GMT or the public for comment, that uh, it would be a course of action. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair, and, and thank you, Lynn. I, I appreciate the sensitivity to this. I just wanna say, for the advisory bodies and the public that this doesn't change the intent of the motion from yesterday. This really just streamlines um, how it's presented. So other than removing the alternative to that was in place in November, this, this really doesn't significantly change where we ended up yesterday. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? I don't see any hands. I'll call for the question. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Abstain. Thank you. Uh, we have one abstention, Caroline McKnight. All others voted you in favor of the motion, therefore the motion passes. Is there any other business to take up on this agenda item while it's open? I'm not seeing any hands, so we will close this agenda item and I will pass the gavel back to our chair. Well, that's very kind of you, Vice Chair Hassamer, but our next agenda item is G6 considerations for a sable fish assessment. I'm gonna pass the hot potato right back to you. Thank you. Uh, for G6, then I will immediately turn to Marlene Bellman, who is online to introduce this agenda item. 
Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer and members of the council. Uh, it's Marlene Bellman from council staff joining you remotely. Per your council request in March, uh, the Northwest Fishery Science Center has provided an overview on the status of the age reading to support the planned 2023 ground fish stock assessments in your advanced briefing book. Um, this is to support the process for discussion about above average recruitment success in sablefish that was raised uh, at the March meeting. And at the current meeting, the council is uh, scheduled to provide guidance on regarding the addition of a sablefish stock assessment update to the ground fish stock assessment cycle. In addition, you'll be uh, hearing from Dr. Owen Hamel. He has also provided a supplemental presentation today regarding the considerations for the sablefish assessment update. And you'll also have uh, supplemental reports provided by the SSC, the GMT, and the GAP. All right, thank you. Are there any questions before we begin? I don't see any questions on the overview, so we'll turn immediately then to the SSC report. And we have Dr. Owen Hamel, on the line. Dr. Hamel, you can uh, start anytime you're ready. Oh, excuse me. Uh, before you start, it's the NIMS report, not the SSC report. So the National Marine Fishery Service report. Sorry about that. Great. That's thought. I, that's what I thought I was presenting. Uh, so, um, uh, Thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, and Council Members. I'll be presenting on the potential for a limited assessment update for sablefish in 2023 and a bit on aging that we have done to support the 2023 stock assessments. Uh, next slide. So uh, since June of last year, so that's Oops. Um, uh, so in the past 10 months, uh, the Cooperative Aging Program has read nearly 22,000 otoliths to support West Coast stock assessments. You can see there's a little issue with the slides, but I'll just keep going. Uh, the For copper rockfish, we've read over 1,000 otoliths. And since then, and a total of over 4,000 have been read in the past couple of years to support the California assessments. Uh, for black rockfish, we've read over 2,000 otoliths, and Oregon and Washington are re reading their respective state collective otoliths as well. Uh, for Petrali Sol, we've read nearly 6,000 otoliths, and for Canary, over 8,000. For Rex Sol, which is going to be a data moderate assessment and won't have ages directly in the assessment, uh, we've read about 600 to inform growth uh, for the growth curve that will be put into the assessment. And for Pacific Hake, uh, which assessment has already been accepted for management, uh, about 4,000 otoliths from the fishery uh, to support that assessment earlier this year. Uh, next slide. Okay, so. To recap, this slide, which was uh, provided in March, uh, this is what we're seeing in terms of different length ranges. Um, the number of uh, fish we estimate to have been caught in the survey in different length ranges. Um, over the course of the survey, uh, the asterisks represent years where there was no or reduced sampling. For instance, in 2020, there was no survey. And in 2019, we only collected half as much data. Uh, so, you know, we had a strong year class in 2016, which was reflected in the 2017 and 18 uh, surveys where there were larger numbers of these uh, age one and two fish, these 
as seen in the black and green for the in 2017 and 18. Um, in 2021, when we had looked at this, we had looked at this as a proportion, and because those 2016 fish existed as longer, as you know, larger fish, the proportion of the small fish didn't look quite as large. But when we're looking at an absolute numbers, the 2021 uh, numbers for these smaller fish is quite large, and it's even larger in 2022. So there's definitely evidence here that there are some very strong year classes recently, 2020, 2021, 2022, potentially, um, that will be, you know, three to five years old by 2025 um, and could be caught in large numbers in the fishery and as bycatch. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so again, the upshot is we think it's probably, uh, it would be a good idea to have an update done this year. If that is to be done, uh, there are two options for when it can be reviewed, as we are already planning to have two uh, ground fish subcommittee meetings in August, the 14th and 15th and the 28th and 29th, to review the star panels and also some catch only projections. So a mid-August review would necessitate a late July draft document. And since we need nearly two months with all the data to be confident about having uh, explored everything for the assessment and to write it up, we would need an early June H data deadline. The late August review would push the draft deadline two weeks and we could keep aging until you know mid-June, the 15th or 20th. Uh, We'll start aging next Monday, um, and this will not affect aging for the other species. All planned aging will be completed. Most of it's been done. Uh, we're, we'll really only be aging for the final star panel for another couple of weeks. Uh, so over the past two years, the survey has collected nearly 4,000 otoliths, about 1,700 last year, and over 2,000 in 2021. So by the end of May, we should be able to age all those 2022 otoliths. And that's the more important year to age because the fish are older. We'll have a better idea of 2020 and 2021 year classes than we would from the 2021 survey. And of course, we'll have some information on 2022 um, as well as earlier year classes. Uh, but the 2021 otoliths are also important and will provide information. Uh, so, uh, if we choose the later August time for review, that will give us an extra two or to three weeks of aging, and we could probably do about half of the 2021 survey. Uh, so that provides us, you know, good information from both surveys on the age composition. We will not be adding fishery composition uh, to this limited assessment update. There won't be time to age any of those, but the fishery doesn't tend to see as many of the youngest fish, so the survey is really more important for, for the information. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, while this is proposed to be a limited assessment update, we would plan on exploring alternative treatment of the survey age data in particular We've been using conditional agent length for survey ages, but that may not work as well uh, when age data are dominated by young fish. And in particular, uh, some of the things we've seen in the survey with some very large toes um, at different times of the year, um, because they're growing fairly rapidly throughout the year, this af can affect the observed length at age. Uh, there's also potential for variable growth rates by year. So we'll be looking at how to best include these age data in the assessment and looking at alternative ways so that we understand the uncertainty in this assessment. Uh, and next slide. So this next slide is the last slide. Um, so while uh, our survey is a good tool to observe incoming recruitments, they still expected to be a high level uncertainty around recent year class strength estimates. Um, 
that's always true. Our estimation of year class strength becomes more informed with additional annual survey and fishery observations, uh, especially as the fish get older. And in addition, since this is proposed to be a limited update assessment that will include recent age data only from the survey, um, there may be a higher level of uncertainty than if we were doing a full assessment and could do more explorations or even a traditional assessment update. Uh, so uh, I'll remind you that back in September, you identified sablefish as a species likely to be selected for a full assessment in 2025. Uh, because of the additional information that will be available over the next couple of years, uh, the fact that we're conducting this um, update, or if we conduct this update, shouldn't really necessarily influence that decision uh, coming up next year. Uh, and that's what I have. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are, are there questions for Dr. Hamel on the NIMS report? Uh, I see one hand up, Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Just a quick sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, thank you, um, Dr. Mill, for the presentation. Uh, just a few questions relative to um, timing on, I think it's slide, oh, there's no numbers on the slides. The fourth slide uh, relative to timing and the uh, groundfish subcommittee meetings. Um, uh, just like to hear a little bit more about the uh, two subcommittee meetings, you mentioned the timing, there's a mid-August and a late August. It sounds like the late August uh, meeting would be preferred uh, to accommodate this stable fish limited as assessment update uh, so that additional aging could be completed. Um, overall, these two subcommittee meetings were on the, on the calendar and pre-planned long before the sablefish um, item came up. So is the intent here that this, these two meetings are able to accommodate any issues related to, that could come out of either the star panel one or two for the prioritized species that we are in the middle of? Uh, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Ms. McKnight. Um, so, uh, yeah, so these are planned, um, so the, the mid-August is planned to look at the first two star panels, as well as the catch-only projections, and the later one was to look originally just at the third star panel because we needed extra time, since that one won't be completed until the end of July. Uh, and so the SSC actually proposed adding um, some time on the 29th as well, uh, in order to accommodate the uh, sablefish update, should that happen. Um, so, you know, because all of these are two-day meetings, there is an opportunity if something comes up on the first day for either the star panels or um, an, an update or a catch-only projection that there would be time to um, look at those things overnight, potentially, if those can be addressed quickly. Um, similarly, if something comes up in the first panel, there's an, uh, a potential to look at it at the second meeting. Um, and of course, the SFC meeting is coming up soon after that, uh, the second one. Um, so uh, yeah, these are scheduled. This, this is a lot more time overall than we usually have had in the past. Uh, for the ground for subcommittee meeting in August. Uh, so uh, there should be plenty of time to deal with any normal sort of thing that comes up. Thank you. Caroline, uh, do you have any follow-up? Yes, um, thank, thank you for that um, answer. Um, yes, relative, and I'm not sure, I know that um, Dr. Hasty uh, generated the report, but in the report one, um, I did have a question on the bottom of page two that was specific to the sablefish age reading. 
It mentions that all of these new age rating would come directly from the trawl survey. Um, but there's a statement that says that, that there is, um, we're unsure how we would partition aging effort between the two surveys owing to some technical considerations and uncertainties about how much overall aging time will be available. I was just curious, what was the reference to two surveys? I, I, it seemed like a presentation alluded to age work only coming from the trial survey. So I just wanted to clarify. Hi, yes. thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Thank you, Ms. McKnight. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the two years of surveys, I believe that Dr. Hastie is referring to the 2022 and 2021 survey okay. the aging. Um, and, you know, since then we've, you know, our intention is probably to age all of the 2022 survey and as much of the 2021 as we can. Um, but as we go along, we may, you know, there's a potential to change our mind and not age quite all of the 2022 and do more of the 2021, but uh, the current intention is to to split it that way. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then uh, last question is related to the last slide and some potential items for consideration. And just in general, I'm, I'm looking for some more information relative to um, the data inputs being used in this limited update assessment, as opposed to, um, I'm going to call it a standard or regular update um, assessment, since this is um, being called a limited one. I'm just looking for any other examples in which we've done this or any analysis to demonstrate that using limited versus all the inputs for an update um, may lend itself to more or less uncertainty um, relative to you know what you've outlined here on this last slide. Yes, well, so um, I, I'm a little bit of, at a loss to think of another example, but it's limited only in the amount of aging we're going to be doing um, and the fact that we're not including the new uh, ages, any new ages from the recent uh, fishery. Uh, so, um, <sighs> You know, again, there will be the length data removals and the age data from the survey. And we generally think of the survey age data as more informative than the fishery age data, um, as the fishery selectivity is more variable from year to year. And so there's more uncertainty about that. Um, but certainly having less information sh will likely lead to more uncertainty. Um, and in any case, the 2022 year class is going to be extremely uncertain because we only have one observation of that. Um, and but there's indication that it could be quite large as well. And so, um, you know, overall, there will be more uncertainty. But I think given that we will be aging um, a lot from the surveys, it won't be, you know, we're not losing that much information um, compared to if we had planned this and were, had been able to age a, quite a few of the uh, fishery age data as well. Thank you for that response. That, that concludes my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Further questions, Chair Gorelnik. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair, and uh, thank you for the presentation, Dr. Hamel. Um, you recited uh, the status of otolith reading for a number of stocks. Um, one stock that was not mentioned was Quillback, which is a stock that's severely constraining um, non trawl fisheries in California. Um, and then elsewhere in the presentation, you, you indicate that this work would not <clears throat> interfere with aging of other otoliths. And I'm just looking for confirmation that that is also true with regard to uh, any otolith aging that's ongoing for the quillback. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, so uh, I don't believe we're currently aging quillback, but we will um, be aging those, uh, you know, 
especially if uh, there's, you know, if there's a potential for a, an assessment in 2025. Um, there aren't a large number of quill back for us to age. Um, so that should not be take, take a long time to do those ages. Um, I know there's also some research being done um, on aging and looking at um, uh, thin sectioning uh, and different approaches to aging to, um, to see what, uh, you know, to do some comparative aging and look for aging error. Um, uh, so this will not affect any of that, no. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, further questions? Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair, and I, I don't know that I necessarily have a question here, but I wanted to thank Dr. Hamel for putting this together, um, really given the council's request for a little bit more information. I know as we're thinking about this, we rely heavily on um, what the Science Center um, says they think they can handle and, and appreciate the the update on the aging for copper, black, petroleum, canary, and Rex that's, that's been done and um, Hake as well, and just feeling some uh, sense that this is, the sable fish update is, is doable um, for the Science Center. Uh, so really just, just thanking Dr. Hamel and folks that worked on this, thank you. Thank you, Heather. Further questions? I don't see any hands, so thank you, Dr. Hamel, for that report. Now we will get to our Scientific and Statistical Committee report, and Dr. Jason Schaffler is here to present that. Good morning, Dr. Schaffler. Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. I will be reading agenda item G6A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, April 2023, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Considerations for a Sablefish Update. The Scientific and Statistical Committee received an overview from Dr. Owen Hamel regarding strong recent sablefish recruitment detected in the 2021 and 2022 West Coast Groundfish Bottom Trawl Surveys and the proposed limited sablefish stock assessment update in 2023. The update would incorporate the trawl survey index and age data from the 2021 and 2022 surveys to provide harvest specifications for 2025 and 2026 that account for evidence of strong recent recruitment. The SSC discussed the proposed scope of the update, workload implications, and whether to proceed. The SSC discussed the need to update the 2021 full stock assessment, considering review capacity, other aging priorities, and assessment workload for the 2023 biennium. The limited scope of the update focusing on aging of only samples from the trial survey should prevent disruption to other ongoing assessment activities previously prioritized for 2023. The SSC is supportive of the approach that is being proposed. The SSC also discussed the potential trade-offs associated with doing the update now and if it would affect future prioritization of a full or update assessment in 2025. The next few years of surveys will continue to track the recent strong cohorts, providing additional information where the selectivity of the year is greater, better informing recent year class strength and future assessments. Assuming the limited update will not preclude consideration of a full assessment in 2025, the SSC is supportive of the limited update this year. The SSC Groundfish Subcommittee can review the update assessment at the second of two subcommittee meetings planned to review 2023 assessments, which is scheduled for August 28th through 29th, 2023. This will provide additional time for aging the over 3,900 samples collected from the surveys during 2021 and 2022. Attendance of the groundfish management team and groundfish advisory subpanel is highly recommended to provide input. And that concludes my statement. Thank you. Are there questions for Dr. Schaffler on his report? Lynn Mattis. 
Uh, thank you for the report. Um, I just want to appreciate the SSC acknowledging that the gap in GMT need to be part of this process. It was something I'd asked for in March. So really appreciate you all considering that. Thank you. Further questions? Caroline McKnight. Um, yes, thank you, and thank you for the report. Um, I'm just uh, going to again ask for some confirmation um, that in the discussion in, in the SSC relative to the timing of the August 28th, 29th subcommittee review, that w there was some discussion about whether or not that, that does allow enough time for discussion for this assessment. Should there be issues or concerns that arise from our other priority species? that we may not be um, expecting or anticipating, but we plan for because occasionally it does happen. Thank you, Ms. McKnight. Yes, the SSC disc did discuss this at length and an additional day, August 29th, was added to that second meeting to accommodate the, the Sablefish, the potential for a Sablefish update. Thank you, thank you very much, I appreciate that. <clears throat> Further questions on the SSC report? And I don't see any hands, so thank you, Dr. Schaffler. We will next move to the groundfish management team report, and Katie Pearson is online to deliver that. Good morning, Katie. Can you hear us okay? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Absolutely. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Hassemer. Uh, good, good morning, uh, council members. My name is Katie Pearson, and I'll be reading agenda item G6A, Supplemental GMT Report 1, April 2023. Groundfish Management Team Report on considerations for a Sablefish Assessment Update. The Groundfish Management Team reviewed the agenda item G6A, Supplemental NIMS Report 1, in the briefing book, received a briefing from Dr. Chantel Wetzel of the Northwest Fishery Science Center and provides the following comments. The GMT supports the addition of a Sablefish assessment update this year. This limited update assessment would provide additional clarity around recent cohorts, potential changes in future spawning biomass, and update harvest limits based on the current Sablefish population. The Science Center proposed that only 2021-2022 fishery removals and data from the Northwest Fishery Science Center Groundfish Bottom Trawl Survey would be added to the 2021 adopted update assessment used for the management. Given this proposal, the GMT understands that the estimates from the assessment may have an increased level of uncertainty that would need to be considered when setting a harvest control rule and could impact the workload during the 2025-26 harvest specification process. The GMT continues to recommend that Sablefish be considered for full assessment in 2025. In the absence of a 2023 update assessment for Sablefish, the GMT foresees potential 2025-26 harvest specification workload implications given the reports from industry concerning a large increase in encounter rates of small Sablefish and the potential need for creating an accountability measure measures or allocation changes to keep mortality within the annual catch limit. The GMT requests the council specify a process whereby the GMT and the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel have a chance to review and provide comments to this Groundfish Subcommittee of the Scientific and Statistical Committee as part of the review. The GMT agrees with the August 28-29 timing of the SSC review and appreciates that the SSC recommends GMT and GAP attendance at this review. And that concludes my report, or our report. Thank you. Are there questions on the Groundfish Management Team report? And I don't see any hands, Katie, so thank you very much for that report. We will next move on to the Groundfish Advisory Subpanel Report. Dan Waldeck is online for that. Good morning, Dan. Good morning, Vice Chair Hassamer. It appears that you can hear me. Uh, I am Dan Waldeck with uh, GAP. I will be reading our report, G6A, Considerations for a Sablefish Assessment Update. Dr. Chantel Westel, NIMFS, and Ms. Marlene Bellman, Council Staff, briefed the GAP on consideration for a Sablefish Assessment Update.
The GAP offers the following recommendations and comments on consideration of a stable fish update assessment, which are consistent with the SSC recommendations. The GAP received an overview from Dr. Wetzel, which detailed the very strong recruitment of sable fish that were seen in the recent 21-22 West Coast groundfish bottom trawl surveys. This strong recruitment has led to the recommendation to consider conducting a limited sable fish stock assessment update in 2023 that could be used to inform the 25-26 biennial harvest specifications and management measures cycle. The GAP notes, we previously commented in September 2022 under stock assessment planning as to the industry concerns of huge influxes of both juvenile and adult sable fish showing up in trawl fisheries, squid fisheries, charter boat fisheries as far south as Santa Barbara, as well as even peer-based sport fisheries. The gap is concerned management may very well start to become affected by increased bycatch in all sectors. The gap fully supports going forward with conducting this limited sable fish update provided it does not impact any of the ongoing aging work associated with the other already scheduled assessments and reviews this year. SSC report one suggests that the limited nature of this update that will focus only on age samples from the trawl survey should not disrupt any of the other scheduled assessments. The gap agrees with the SSC. The gap also agrees with the SSC that the results of this limited update should be in should in no way preclude the planned 2025 full assessment where we will we'll be looking at data in much greater depth and detail. Lastly, the gap concurs with the SSC suggestion that a gap member attend the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee review of the Civil Fish Assessment Update currently proposed for August 28, 29, 2023. That ends the gap report. Thank you, Vice Chair Hasmer. <laughs> Thank you. Are, the, are there questions on the ground fish advisory subpanel report? And there are no hands raised, Dan. So again, thank you very much for that report. You're welcome. That completes all of our reports and takes us to public comment. I see we have one signed up. It's up on our screen, uh, Sergio Vesquez. Sergio, can you hear us? I am checking to see. Is he online with us? All right, he is not online with us at this time. So we will not be able to take that comment. which will conclude our public comment and take us into council discussion and action. So I will look for any hands to start the discussion on this agenda item. Heather Hall. Thank you, Vice Chair. I'll, I'll just get started by um, saying that I, I think an update here would be um, important and very beneficial. Um, I think we've heard, we've heard from the GMT under in season at this meeting, um, catch in, of sable fish in 2022 approaching the ACL. We've been hearing from the gap um, last year that the catch of sable fish in all sectors is, uh, is really high. I, I think I, I, I appreciate the concern for you know, what does this mean for the stock assessment process and trying to anticipate, um, you know, potential problems or bottlenecks. But I, I, I think the bottleneck really could be in having a huge discrepancy between the ACL without an update and, and what folks are seeing in their fishing operations. And so um, I'm, I'm just obviously supporting the stable fish assessment update and just wanted to offer that for now for discussion. Thank you. Further discussion. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Vice, Vice Chairman. And um, thank you, Heather, for your comments. Um, I'm, I'm very conflicted on this item um, in general. I've been thinking about it since March. Um, I, I feel pretty comfortable 
as of this morning, hearing from all the advisory bodies that the front initial workload to complete the limited assessment can be accommodated. Um, but one thing that is really um, hanging on me really heavily is that we don't know what the outcome of any of our priority species might be. And we also don't know what the outcome of this update or limited update might be. Um, and hearing that, you know, there is only half of one year's worth of the age data being included, hearing that, you know, young fish can in, increase the uncertainty. I'm really, I'm really sitting here thinking what happens if there's um, trouble on the other end and then what do we do with it? Um, I'm troubled by the fact that there, this is limited and not a full update. Um, I'm not sure if we have anything within our terms of reference that prescribe how to handle um, this type of a situation. Um, I very much appreciate that we are seeing these fish also in the fishery and that the ACL might be constraining in the years to come. Um, but I also don't want to put us in a situation where we do a limited amount of work now that may cause more uncertainty rather than just waiting to do the full assessment when more of the aging work can be completed, another year of trial survey can be completed, and we can take the time to do the full assessment and give it full attention and a full star panel review. Um, it, it is likely that um, I am channeling or feeling that I am reflecting on our past uh, assessment cycle where we learned some lessons, some hard lessons. And I feel that there is um, maybe something to take and apply here. Um, I, I do appreciate everyone's input in looking at this and um, I welcome a little bit more discussion on, on how to work through this and come to the right decision. But at this time, I'm, I'm leaning more with, with not supporting adding this, this workload. Um, to the plate. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. Further discussion on this. Uh, we've heard so guidance to support moving forward. We've heard guidance to not to move forward on this. So I want to get a sense of the full council's position on this and what we should do. Where am I at? Caroline, your, your hand is still raised. Did you have something additional? Oh, it's down now, but uh, Vice Chair Penninger. Um, yeah, thank you, um, Vice Chair Hass Hassemer. Um, you know, we asked to have them do this, the Science Center do this, um, to, to work it in um, last year. And they said they couldn't do it. Um, they got to look at the information and they've, um, uh, and it's always going to be an issue and they've uh, set aside people to do it and they say they can do it. I don't know what the issue is here. Um, you know, we could we get the information back at the end of the summer. We can uh, judge it on its merits. And I'm sure the science uh, center folks will uh, give us the full um, uh, the full backstory on, on how things went and where they lacked the information and where the uncertainty was, and we could decide then. But I think that, um, you know, this is needed to be done. It was, it was recognized that by the fleet in November, and uh, this seems to me like a no-brainer. Thank you. Thank you. Chair Gorelnik. <clears throat> Thank you, Vice Chair Hassler. I I'm sympathetic to this potential problem on the horizon that we're going to see an explosion in sable fish and not have an assessment uh, available to uh, avoid problems in the fishery. <clears throat> um, I, I, I wish we could get the same enthusiasm for uh, another stock assessment that's now scheduled for 2025 that is currently shutting down or extremely limiting a fishery, a council managed fishery. So I, I'm inclined to support this 
but I would ask the council and the science center to perhaps provide a similar priority or a similar interest in the quill back, which is, uh, I know we have copper, hopefully we'll be taken care of this year. But right now quill back scheduled for 2025, and that's gonna be basically maybe three years of a severely constrained, maybe even further constrained than they are right now, uh, non trawl fishery in California. Thank you. Further discussion, Phil Anderson. I too am, I don't know if I'm sympathetic, but I recognize um, and agree with folks who have observed uh, this on what I think is, is an unprecedented number of small sable fish on the grounds. Um, I just in my little world where I go, I've never, I haven't seen anything like it before that I recall. Uh, the, the, the catches uh, so far this year, as well as last year, uh, in terms of the um, small sable fish, um, seem to me to validate the, the concern. Um, Sable fish, obviously, we spend a lot of time talking about sable fish and acknowledging how important it is to our fisheries. Um, I don't think I would be enthusiastic about supporting this if I didn't think that this was truly a, a, an unusual circumstance uh, and that in the absence of trying to get some updated information from a stock assessment perspective that um, we don't, that we're not risking um, some significant cutbacks and restrictions uh, based on the stock assessment that we're currently making our management decisions on. So I support moving forward with this. Thank you. Joe Oatman. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. And um, I want to say I do uh, support uh, comments that Phil just made. I think um, those are, um, you know, similar uh, points, you know, from the travel perspective. Uh, we think that this um, update would be uh, pretty important um, uh, relative to uh, travel fisheries and we would support um, moving forward with that. Thank you. Look for further hands. Um, we don't have clear agreement on what to do. Heather Hall. Well, thank you. You might have been going in this direction, uh, Vice Chair. I, I was going to ask, I don't know if we can just provide our guidance here. There's a, a need for a motion. Um, a motion would make it cleanest. Um, I, I do have one ready that I've sent to Sandra, if that would help us. All right. If you're ready to make that motion. I'll still look for hands for additional discussion, but uh, there it is on the screen. So go ahead and read your motion. I move the council add a sable fish stock assessment update to the current ground fish stock assessment cycle. The language on the screen is accurate. Yes. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Lynn Mattis. Speak to your motion. Well, I, I have started to hear a little bit uh, this morning. I think this is a, an important um, move for us to make here, given what we're hearing. From, and I feel comfortable with that, given what we're hearing from the Science Center. Um, if the motion passes, I have some guidance to offer as well, too. Give it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions to the maker of the motion for clarification? 
I don't see any hands, so we'll move to discussion. Any discussion on the motion? Caroline McKnight. Uh, yes, thank you. I was trying to get my hand up. Um, I actually had a question um, on the language of the motion for Heather. Um, thanks for the motion, Heather. Um, was the intent here for it to read uh, add a stable fish uh, limited stock assessment update as that's how it's been referred to in the Science Center documents to date? Thank you for the question, Ms. McKnight. Um, I, I don't know if, if adding the word limited um, is needed here. I, I was just taking this as the guidance from the Science Center. If it would be helpful, I, I would do that. It, I think that is the way it's been spoken to. Um, we could add limited after A. And that, that's right. I, I think if, in speaking to your motion, if you make it clear that you're referencing the reports and the documents, it, it should be on the record. Okay, thank you. So as long as you state that, that's yeah, what you intend. That's, that's the intent. I'm, I'm looking to the statements from the SSC, the report by from the Northwest Fishery Science Center and NIMS, um, regarding their approach to doing this stock assessment update in a limited way. Thank you. Thank you. Does that answer your question, Caroline? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to make sure we were, we had as much clarity as possible. So thank you. Thank you. Further discussion on the motion. And I'm not seeing any hands. I will call the question. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Abstentions? The uh, Caroline McKnight voted no. Uh, all others voted in favor of that, so the motion passes. And I will look for any further discussion. Heather Hall. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to offer the guidance that we also heard from the SSC and the Science Center in terms of scheduling the um, groundfish subcommittee review um, at the, the later in August, the August 28th through 29th time frame to give the, the folks that are working on it the, the most time for age rating. Also really appreciate the, um, the thought and bringing in the, and the importance of bringing in the GMT and the gap for that review uh, when the time comes. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion guidance needed. making sure I cover everybody's hands, but I don't see anything. So I will turn back to Marlene and ask uh, if there, how we've done here and is there anything else for the council to do? Thank you, uh, Vice Chair Hesmer. The council heard uh, updates and was had an opportunity to provide additional questions for the Science Center regarding the stock assessment activities there. Um, you also heard from your advisory bodies and had a, a robust council discussion on various aspects of considerations that uh, were relevant to this discussion. Um, there was a clarity of providing a motion and, and passing a motion related to adding this, as well as the additional guidance for the SSC, the GMT and the GAP. And so I believe that that uh, concludes the objectives that we had for this agenda item. All right. Thank you, Marlene. Last chance for hands. Not seeing any, uh, we will close this agenda item and I will pass the gavel back to our chair. 
All right, thank you very much for completing our last ground fish item of the meeting. Uh, I'm gonna look around and see if folks want a short break or whether we can uh, conquer uh, membership appointments and COPs that go forward. All right, so we're gonna, and then what we'll do is we'll take a longer break as we do on day last, allow people to check out of the rooms and whatever else they need to do. So Deputy Director Kelly Ames, you wanna get us started? You bet. Good morning, Chair Girl, Net Council members. This is agenda item F6, membership appointments and council operating procedures. Uh, during this agenda item, the council considers administrative appointment issues regarding the council membership roster, including council members, advisory body members, and any relevant changes in the council's operating procedures or statement of organization practices and procedures. Relative to council officers, members and designees, since publishing the advanced briefing book, we learned that Dave Hansen will be retiring after 30 successful years with Pacific States. With Dave Hansen's retirement, there will be changes to the legislative and budget committee rosters. For the legislative committee, appointments are made by the council chair, usually in consultation with the council. If folks are interested and have not yet had the opportunity to express that interest, it would be good to do so in order to be considered. For the Budget Committee, Dave Hansen occupied the Pacific State seat, and thus Barry Tom will fill that role until a replacement is identified by Pacific States. Council Advisory Body Appointments for the 2022 to 2024 term. For the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpanel, the council recently solicited nominations for the vacant processor position on the CPSAS and received a nomination from Mr. Mark Fina, which was provided to you as closed session A1, attachment one. For the ecosystem advisory subpanel, the council recently solicited nominations for the Washington position on the EAS, but did not receive any nominations. This solicitation was extended with a deadline of May 22nd for council consideration at the June 2023 meeting. As a reminder, and you can see on our homepage banner, we also have solicitations open for the CPSAS subpanel uh, commercial position and the HMSAS subpanel commercial troll position. For council advisory body agency appointments, for the Groundfish Endangered Species Work Group, the Northwest Fisheries Science Center has nominated Dr. Kaylee Summers to replace Dr. Jason Janet for the Observer Program position on the Groundfish Endangered Species Work Group that was provided in closed session A1, attachment two. The SSC reviewed this nomination and reported to the council under closed session. For the Groundfish Management Team, the Southwest Fisheries Science Center has nominated Dr. Aaron Mamula to the Southwest Fishery Science Center position on the GMT, which was closed session attachment three. Dr. Mamula is an economist and thus could also fulfill the GMT membership objective that one member should be an economist. And this is in council operating procedure number three. The SSC reviewed this nomination and reported to the council under closed session. For the remaining vacancies, uh, Mr. Joe Peterson resigned his position on the GMT, leaving the tribal position vacant. For your council operating procedures, in November 2022, the council tasked staff with updating COP9 Schedule 3 for the coastal pelagic species management cycle to reflect the correct assessment type in the assessment schedule for Pacific mackerel and to revise the timing of the stock assessment and fishery evaluation document to once per year. Additionally, edits were provided related to Amendment 20 CPS management categories, and that is in Attachment 3. Council action under this agenda item is appointing a nominee to the processor position on the CPSAS. Number two, appointing a Northwest Fishery Science Center nominee to the Groundfish Endangered Species Work Group. Number three, appointing the Southwest Fisheries Science Center nominee to the Groundfish Management Team. And number four, consider adopting the proposed changes to COP9. 
uh, reference materials uh, in your briefing book that I wanted to highlight. Uh, we do have two supplemental uh, advisory body reports, one from the GMT and one from the CPSMT. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Kelly. Let's see if there are any questions. And you did a very thorough job, so I don't see any hands. So we will move from there into our reports. Uh, well, first, the CPS MT has a report, and I understand Jesse Dorpinghouse will read that into the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, this is Supplemental CPSMT Report 1. The CPSMT recommends adopting the changes to COP9 as proposed in Agenda Item F6, Attachment 1. And that is the entire statement. <laughs> yeah, no need questions. to summarize that report. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any um, any questions on that report? All right, thank you very much. Uh, we have a report from the Groundfish Management Team, James Phillips. Good morning, Council. Good morning. Uh, for, the rec uh, for the record, my name is James Phillips with the Groundfish Management Team, and I'll be reading Supplemental GMT Report 1 on Agenda Item F6. Uh, the GMT would like to thank the Southwest Fisheries Science Center for nominating an economist to the GMT. The GMT supports the nomination of Dr. Aaron Mamula to the GMT. Dr. Mamula will provide expert economic analysis and considerations for team discussions. The GMT would also like to acknowledge the hard work and years of dedication service from two of our former members. The first is our recent former chair and tribal seat designee, Mr. Joe Peterson. And the second is our team historian and multi-year member of, of the leadership team in both the chair and vice chair roles, Ms. Lynn Mattis. The GMT wants to recognize their invaluable contribution and thanks them immensely for their service. All right, thank you very much, James. Any questions on the report? I know it's a big loss into the GMT to lose Lynn, but it's a big gain for the council, so sorry. Um, I'm not seeing any hands, so thank you for the report. Uh, look for, I don't think, believe we have any public comment, so that will take us to our council discussion and action. And I would propose uh, as a form of organization to take it in the order that we had in our overview. And our overview started with uh, advisory body appointments. So we have, I think it was mentioned that we had three. So um, I will look around to see if there's any discussion. And if there is no discussion, um, and I'm not seeing any hands, I'll see if we have a nomination um, or an, a, a motion to appoint a summon to the CPSAS, the processor seat. And uh, Mr. Anderson. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, gives me a great pleasure to bring this candidate forward. For council consideration, um, I move the council appoint Mr. Mark Fina to the processor position on the Coastal Pelagic Species Advisory Subpen. All right, thank you. The, the language on the screen does appear accurate and complete. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Corey Ridings. Please speak to your motion. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. As I said, it's it's um, great to be able to bring this um, recommendation forward. Uh, Mark brings with him over 20 years of experience, primarily working in the North Pacific Council arena. Um, his background demonstrates that he has a, uh, a um, solution-oriented, um, brings a solution-oriented objective to complex problems and problem solving. Um, he's currently the executive director of the California Wet Fish Producers Association. Uh, and I think we've, we've uh, had fortune, good fortune of seeing him here at the uh, council meetings uh, since he took that position. And um, he's uh, demonstrated 
his ability to fit in and work within the council process in a very meaningful way. So I think he's going to be a, uh, a bring a lot of value to the uh, sub panel. All right. Thank you very much for the, for the motion. Any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion? Not seeing any hands. I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion. Congratulations, Mark Fina. Uh, next, I'd like to turn to the vacancy on the ground fish endangered species work group. Mr. Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I have a motion. I move the council appoint Dr. Kaylee Summers to the observer program position on the ground fish endangered species work group. Okay, the language there appears accurate and complete. I'll look for a second. Seconded by Lynn Mattis. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Summers has participated in past work group meetings as a lead author on one of the primary reports and provided expert guidance regarding the use of observer data and bycatch estimation methodologies and procedures. And she has extensive bycatch and protected species experience as a key scientist producing those estimates for the West Coast for many years, uh, as well as pertinent council experience through her many years of service on the GMT. So we think she'd be a great addition to the work group. All right, any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion? Lynn Mattis. Uh, having worked with Dr. Summers on the GMT for many years, I do believe she'll be a very valuable addition to to this work group. All right, thank you. All right, I'm not seeing any other hands, so I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion, Ryan, and congratulations, Dr. Summers. Uh, we have one further um, vacancy on the ground fish management team. Uh, Ryan Wolf. Yes, I have another motion. Thank you, Sandra. I move the council appoint Dr. Aaron Mamula to the Southwest Fisheries Science Center position on the ground fish management team. Okay, and the language there is accurate and complete. I will look Correct. for a second. Seconded by Phil Anderson. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Dr. Mamula has over 12 years of economics research experience with a focus on marine fisheries has been an employee of the Southwest Center since 2008. And during that time, he has served on numerous NIMS committees, presented on multiple topics related to fisheries economics and made substantial scientific contributions to the field of groundfish and salmon fisheries economics. And I uh, believe his background and his experience will fill a needed gap on the GMT as noted by Deputy Director Ames in her overview uh, and fully support this nomination. Thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion? Lynn Mattis. I want to thank the Southwest Science Center for supplying uh, and Dr. Mamula for volunteering or getting volunteers to join the GMT. The team has been uh, one person short for a number of years and having an economist on the team will greatly help fill a void in expertise. So we really, really appreciate. And I'm going to say we because I still can't not say we when referring to the GMT at times. Um, we really appreciate having that expertise added. Thank you. All right. Any further discussion? Not seeing any hands. I'll call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you for the motion. And congratulations to Dr. Mamala. I think those are the positions we're able to fill on advisory bodies. Uh, we do have vacancies that uh, Kelly Ames identified. And um, I guess we will continue to advertise uh, the uh, opening on, well, why don't you, Ms. Ames, refresh your recollection on the vacancies and um, I want to get con confirmation. We continue want to get, want to keep those advertised and try to get them filled. 
thank you, Chair Gronick. Yes, we have uh, three vacancies currently open. They are on our homepage. There is a banner that directs you to uh, the application process. So the three positions are the Washington seat on the ecosystem advisory sub panel, the commercial seat on the coastal pelagic species advisory sub panel, and a commercial troll position on the HMSAS advisory sub panel. And, and thank you, uh, Sandra, for demonstrating our website here. Uh, we would really appreciate uh, nominations by May 22nd, which would allow us to prepare those materials for council consideration at the June 2023 meeting. All right, thank you for that. Um, also with Joe Peterson resigning his position on the GMT, there is a open tribal seat. So we'll be looking for that seat to be filled and look forward to uh, a nomination there. Um, the only, uh, you also mentioned that uh, Dr. Hansen has retired from his position uh, here at the council and that leaves uh, one vacancy to be filled on the legislative committee. Uh, one council member has stepped forward with interest in that position. I, I would like to give, don't wanna short circuit the process so, if anyone else has an interest in that open position, please let me know in the next few days. And if I don't receive any other interest, that matter will be settled. So before we move on to COPs and other matters under this agenda item, I just want to double check with Kelly Ames that we've taken care of appointments. Thank you, Chair Gronick. Yes, you, are com you have completed the appointments. All right. So now we have uh, changes to the COPs and I'll try to get some discussion going there or a motion. Caroline McKnight. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Unless there is discussion um, or questions, um, I believe I might be prepared to give a motion. Well, I think that you should bring your motion forward and then that may engender some discussion. Very good. I will um, give Sandra just a moment. Very good, I can see it. Um, I move the council adopt the changes to COP9 as recommended by the CPSMT and agenda item F6A, supplemental CPSMT report one, April, 2023. All right, thank you very much. The language on the screen appears accurate and complete. And I'll look for a second. Seconded by Lynn Mattis. Uh, please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the, the recommended changes here are supported by the CPSMT um, are, are very minor and editorial in nature to more appropriately reflect um, language and intent. Um, it's very straightforward and minor, so I, I don't think there's much more to speak to at this point. So thank you. All right, thank you. Um, any questions for Caroline on the motion or discussion on the motion? And I'm not seeing any hands other than Caroline's, and I assume you don't want to have a comment. Very good, hands down. So I'm not seeing any hands for discussion on this motion. And if there's nothing to discuss, then the only thing left to do is to vote. So all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? The motion passes unanimously. So that takes care of appointments, that takes care of the COP. Let's see if there's any other business for the council. Corey Ridings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I wanted to circle back on the committee idea that was discussed during our EEJ item earlier in the week. Um, I have a motion if that's helpful. Motions tend to be great organizing principles for discussion, so please. Thank you. 
I move that the council form an ad hoc equity and environmental justice committee to assist the council in addressing EEJ issues and in particular to advise the council on working with NIMS on the forthcoming EEJ strategy regional implementation plan and the geographic strategic plan. The group includes a tribal member, a member from each state and a NIMS member, Mr. Joseph Oatman, Ms. Heather Hall, Ms. Krista Svensson, Mr. Virgil Moore, Ms. Corey Writings, and a NIMS member. All right, I'll look for a second, seconded by Krista Svensson. Um, please speak to your motion. Um, I actually just a quick procedural question, Mr. Chair. Um, the language on the screen isn't quite correct. Do you want to do that technical correction now, or should yes, I speak to the motion first? Yes, let's do that. Um, I thought it was, yeah, maybe I skipped that step, or that's okay. It was a very what? last minute addition. So, uh, Sandra, just after, oh, there it is, the geographic strategic plan. It was um, in that third line at the end of the sentence. Thank you. Okay, so now we it moved by Corey, seconded by Krista. Please speak to your motion. Thank you. Um, we had a robust discussion under this agenda item earlier in the week. Um, a lot was said. I think there was a lot of issues brought forward. I think a lot of um, good thoughts, considerations. Uh, there's a lot of sort of sub issues under this, a lot of tentacles, and I think this would be helpful um, to get that going. Um, we discussed forming a group then, as we did in September. Um, specifically, uh, there's a need to have the council engagement with NIMPS on the forthcoming regional implementation plan, as well as the geographic strategic plan, which includes EEJ as part of it, um, to help ensure that the regional plan is well fitted for our coast, uh, take into account the council's responsibilities and processes, and can help the council move forward with its EEJ efforts. Um, it was noted uh, to address issues such as equity and environmental justice, we need to be strategic and focused, and hopefully working with NIMPS on the regional strategy via this group can help us get us started in that direction. All right, thank you. I have one comment. Generally, appointments are made by the chair in consultation with the council, so this would constitute consultation with the council for the purpose of the appointments. Yeah, sorry about that. If that was um, not fine. clear, um, are, is there any are there any questions for the maker of the motion or discussion on the motion? Ryan Wolf, and then Phil, and then Phil Anderson. Yeah, thank you, Chair. And I just want to um, thank Ms. Rogers for the motion and just note that uh, NIMS is fully supportive of this. This is very consistent with. Um, uh, the, you know, feedback, guidance, interactions we are looking for uh, with the council um, on both the regional implement, implementation plan for the EJ strategy as well as the geographic strategic plan. Um, and I will be able to um, give a name to that NIMS member very, very shortly after this meeting. So thank you. Mr. Anderson. Yeah, I just wondered if you had... Um, Corey, if you had some sense of, of how often this group would meet, I uh, was wondering if there had been any consultation with the executive director from a budget perspective, just to understand what the budget implications of this having this group are, that would it, at least in part be informed by how often uh, this you envision that this group would be meeting uh, would they be in person meetings? Would they be held in conjunction with council meetings or, or, you know, any, any of those types of details that you could provide would be helpful. Thanks, Mr. Anderson. Um, I did have discussions with uh, the council executive director and um, deputy director about this to try to get a feeling for workload um, as was stated during the uh, agenda item earlier in the week, you know, there are some concerns about that as well as some thoughts about potentially some creative partnerships down the road, um, funding from NIMPS, other ways to get this work done. Um, to your question, um, 
in forming this group, I think that there would be the potential for some in-person meetings. I think your idea about having them in conjunction with council meetings is probably smart. Um, the exact structure, I don't know, and would continue to lean on council staff to make the best suggestions about how that was to happen. Bill. And maybe I, if I could, um, Mr. Chairman, just if I could ask uh, either um, Ms. Ames or Mr. Burden, if they um, have thought about what the, uh, the implications from a staffing perspective are relative to the uh, council staff and their, bill, and their capacity and ability to staff this ad hoc group. Merrick? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for the discussion and for consideration of staffing, Phil. Um, as uh, Ms. Writings did indicate, uh, we have had a couple of conversations about this throughout the week. Uh, of course, staffing is um, something that we are uh, always thinking about and concerned about. Um, everyone at the council office works at about 100 to 120 percent, it seems. Um, as we uh, consider this, uh, we would be intending to uh, have Jim Seeger to staff uh, this committee um, for as long as he is available and uh, working with us. Um, what we have also discussed with Ms. Writings is that um, this committee would have to think of itself as a, as a working committee. Um, so I know a lot of committees will defer work to staff. Uh, we do not have much extra capacity. Uh, on staff to, to pick up some additional work, as I think everyone knows, but um, we would be looking to this committee to do uh, quite a bit of the legwork. Um, so I think I think that should address uh, your uh, staffing question, Phil, um, and maybe just to rewind a little bit um, in regards to resources and when the committee would meet, uh, we did discuss essentially two models one, have the committee meeting during a council meeting and take advantage of uh, folks that are uh, in transit anyway. So we might think of that as, um, you know, akin to a LC or a BC meeting, uh, have folks travel uh, the day before, or two days before for that meeting. And we also discussed having uh, online meetings. Um, all that being said, uh, as I'm sure you know and are well aware of, it's often hard to gather council members for meetings. Uh, so I would be surprised if, if a group met all that frequently, but uh, the actual number, of course, is hard to pin down. Hopefully that uh, answers some of your questions, Mr. Anderson. Yeah, thanks very much, Mary. Further discussion on the motion? Krista Svensson. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I am supportive of the motion and will be voting in favor of it. I think we had a robust discussion on the topic earlier in the week. I think there's a lot of support from the advisory panels and the public for this particular topic. Um, and I'm appreciative of the um, work that went into building out a committee, um, potentially, um, in terms of making sure that we had gone through the proper channels with the executive director, um, what that could look like for workflow, um, and that it is inclusive of all of our geographic areas and state and federal uh, level people. So just wanting to say thank you for the work that you've done crafting this and that I will be supporting. All right, thank you. Uh, Merrick, your hand is still up. And I saw Bob Dooley raise his hand, Bob. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I support this as well. I, I think it's, you know, it, it, it's needed. There's no doubt through all the conversations we've had. I think it's something we can do. The question I have, and this is probably for Merrick, uh, is how much council floor time do you think this is going to take? Is this going to be something akin to the marine planning where we have every advisory panel weighing in? And how many times a year do you think this will be? in our uh, in, on our agenda and i'm just trying to get a sense of how much this will uh add to our our council workload as far as agenda time so that that's it thank you merrick 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Um, uh, thank you for the question, Bob. Uh, that's a very good question. A um, couple of things are coming to mind uh, in response. So, so one is, um, as I think everyone is aware, um, and I think you know, Miss Writings is uh, um, uh, specifically aware, given her expertise. Um, EEJ is a, a very large topic, um, and uh, it has the potential to be uh, very broad. Um, and this is something that uh, Ms. Writings and uh, Ms. Ames and I spent some time talking about yesterday. And um, what we had envisioned in that conversation was, uh, well, one, to make sure that the council is giving clear specificity to the committee about what it wants the committee to work on um, so that the uh, committee is responding to the council's needs very specifically. With that in mind, uh, that model should then help to control the time and expansiveness of this item on the council's agenda. That being said, um, as we look out into the future, um, so that under the next agenda item that we'll take up, for instance, under workload planning, uh, we do have um, EEJ scheduled on the council's agenda coming up in September, I believe. So that would be in response to uh, the NIMS uh, EEJ strategy. And so there are a couple of ways to, to do this. One is we could treat it like uh, most of our agenda items and have our all of our advisory bodies weigh in on it. I don't think that question is specific to this committee that's being contemplated right now. Um, so I, I think it's uh, that matter in and of itself will create its own agenda momentum or uh, time, if, if that makes sense. This committee uh, could uh, simplify things for the council. Uh, so this might be a question back to you all. Um, if we have this committee set up uh, as an advisor to the council, do we want the other advisory bodies not to weigh in uh, and, and defer to this committee entirely? That would be one question for you all as the council. Um, or does this committee add to what ad other advisory bodies might be commenting on? Uh, and if so, that would be, you know, more akin to what we see usually on our agendas. Um, so that's not a, a direct response, Bob, uh, but that is, a, I think, a question back to you all in terms of does this committee uh, act um, to advise the council alone or if not alone, then uh, give, be given clear priority? Uh, and if so, that could help us to streamline what's on the council's agenda. I hope that makes some sense, but I'm happy to elaborate a bit of that. Thank you, Merrick. That that is exactly the point that I was trying to make. So thank you. Phil Anderson, then Lynn Mattis. Um, I was thinking back uh, as an example, the Sam Tech Committee, the council created a fairly specific charge um, for that committee. Um, and I'm, it's my opinion that this committee should also have a council charge where we all understand um, what it's going to do. Obviously the, well, I don't know, obviously to me, the, the breadth of the equity and environmental justice um, issues can can be extremely broad, um, and um, or we or it we the charge could try to make sure that the ad hoc committee was focused and kind of stayed, my word, stayed within our lane. Uh, that is the council's lane on this issue in advising NIMPS on their EEJ strategy and their regional implementation plan. Um, so um, I, I do have a concern about um, um, not having those types of specific um, sideboards for the committee to work within um, so I um, so I just would express that concern 
the issue that Merrick brings forward is one that uh, um, I, I don't ever recall um, where we establish a committee and then we preclude other committees from engaging on the topic. That's a, that's a new one on me and um, would be in my mind unprecedented. Um, so that, that, that is a concern if, if, if that's where we're headed. Um, so if you hear some reluctance in my comments to creating this committee without having some more of those specifics nailed down, uh, you are reading me right. Um, I don't intend to stand in the way, nor could I, I don't think from the council moving forward on the motion. Uh, but I do have some concerns that some additional work is needed uh, to ensure that the committee is focused on the area where the council wants it to be and where, um, where our primary focus on this relatively broad topic should be. Lynn Metis. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Is there going to be, I know there's some discussion about how the um, advisory bodies would be involved, but will there at some point be a nexus? I know there's some folks on um, various advisory bodies who would have a lot to, uh, to add to this conversation as we move forward. It doesn't have to be decided today, but at some point I think it would be good to bring their, some of their expertise in. Um, you know, I, I know as an example, Katie Pearson on the GMT as part of her work within ODFW has been doing a lot of work on DEI stuff and she's the one that put in the equity lens in the GMT report. Uh, so getting their expertise and advice at some point, maybe not right now, but at some point I do believe would be helpful. Thank you. Corey Writings. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I would echo what Lynn just said and what um, Phil noted about um, making sure that our ABs and MTs are included in this and have the opportunity to be engaged. Um, earlier this week, we heard we got some really good reports and we had some good ideas and I think reflected some fruitful discussion in those bodies. So I think that they would should certainly be part of this. So. Um, Looking for any further discussion on this agenda item, or rather on this motion. And I'm not seeing any hands. So I will call the question. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Abstentions? Not having heard any no votes or abstentions, I will conclude that the vote is unanimous for this motion. Thank you for the motion. Um, let me ask if there's further action on this agenda item. Kelly, how are we doing? Thank you, Chair Gronick. You uh, have made the requisite appointments under this agenda item adopted uh, the COP9 changes relative to close coastal pelagic species management and uh, formed a new ad hoc uh, council committee to work on environmental justice issues. And with that, I believe you have concluded uh, all necessary action under this agenda item. All right, thank you. So we'll take our break now. I'm gonna look around and see folks whether it should be 20 or 30 minutes. With a 20, 20 minutes, is that an, anyone need more than 20 minutes? All right, not saying anything. We'll be back here at 1010 to work on agenda and workload.
two more. All right, a one minute warning here so folks can grab their sustenance and beverage. Um, All right, we are on the last agenda item of the meeting, provided no one brings the motion forward to revisit a previous agenda item. Um, F7, future council meeting agenda and workload. We have a number of reports, but I will first turn to Executive Director Merrick Burden to orient us. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and orientation is a good word. It's uh, disorienting trying to do this from a hotel room, I'll just say. Um, but we'll do fine. Uh, let's see, this is agenda item F7, uh, which is future council meeting agenda and workload planning. So just as a quick overview, this agenda item is intended to refine general planning for future council meetings with a focus on finalizing the proposed agenda for the June 2023 council meeting in Vancouver. There are a few attachments that uh, I will uh, refer you to. Um, one uh, is attachment one, that is the preliminary year at a glance summary, also known as the YAG. Attachment two, the draft proposed council meeting agenda. But I would note that, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, at the end of the day, we do have two supplementals that have revised both of those. Hopefully, you've had a chance to review them. Um, if not, I will, um, or I will walk you through them anyway here in a minute. Um, you also have a couple of additional uh, attachments. One of those is what's referred to as the council staff proposal on advisory body meeting formats. That is in response to some questions that we've heard and desires we've heard from advisory bodies about pinning down who is in person and who is uh, remote through the balance of the year. And then as you uh, indicated, Mr. Chairman, we do have several um, advisory body reports. Uh, happy to take questions about the overview. Otherwise, uh, I would um, uh, take a few minutes to walk you through both the YAG and the uh, proposed council meeting agenda for June, but I will pause here briefly. Well, I'm not <clears throat> seeing any hands, so please continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, first, if you would like to pull up the uh, supplemental attachment five, that is the proposed specific council meeting agenda for June, uh, just to orient you to that. Um, of course, what we do have generally speaking is a start You'll see on Wednesday, June 21st, with many of our advisory bodies, those advisory bodies that are bolded are proposed for in-person. Uh, note, we do have quite a few. Uh, the one that is, uh, the two rather, my apologies, that are remote are the SAS and SDT. And then moving forward, you can see how the different advisory bodies uh, change and who goes to remote uh, and who stays in person. Uh, the underline, uh, that you see in that case for the enforcement consultants that refer that represents a change for what was in the um, the uh, advanced briefing book materials. Now, if you go across the main council agenda, a couple of things that I will flag for you. Uh, one, the June agenda does seem to be settling out uh, fairly well. Uh, a couple of things of note, however. One is uh, we've proposed to strike the workload and new management measures item under H6. Uh, two, you'll see that the SRFC and KRFC conservation objectives has been unshaded. Um, and we're titling the gear switching matter, the initial PPA, which was the concept that was discussed uh, yesterday. Um, instead of a single PPA, we'll strive for essentially PPA-1 and PPA-2, with PPA-1 coming up in June. 
Um, now, if you would like to turn over to uh, the supplemental attachment four, so I'm doing this a little bit backwards, but I think this is the best way to orient yourself. Uh, this is the supplemental um, preliminary year at a glance summary. And so a few things to highlight here that have changed since uh, what was in your uh, advanced briefing book. Uh, one is uh, June is fairly well stabilized. A couple of matters that um, I've already highlighted by going through the uh, June agenda here a minute ago. If we go to September, uh, one thing you'll note is under salmon, uh, we have had uh, the desire to clarify some aspects of the salmon FMP around the southern res resident killer whale. Uh, that FMP clarification language concerns uh, clarification of essentially roles and responsibilities between the SSC and the SDT and others um, about the threshold calculation. Uh, it's not a policy question, just a question of who does what and when. Um, and then if you go to the bottom, we have added the regional implementation plan for the equity environmental justice matter that uh, NEMS is working on and that we talked about here a few minutes ago under the prior agenda item. Uh, if we go to November, uh, what you see there is Sablefish gear switching is slated for the second step of the PPA uh, that had been originally the FPA, uh, the second step of the PPA scheduled for November. And then you'll see just based on how things are proceeding on our research and data needs effort, uh, we've gone ahead and proposed striking that for November. Uh, we don't foresee that being ready at that time. And we've moved that over to, uh, we've started to move both of those, sorry, over to March. So both of those referring to September and November, and instead we're proposing picking this up in March. Also in March then, we are aiming for uh, Sablefish gear switching FPA in March of next year. Um, at this point, Mr. Chairman, I think it would be helpful to uh, go ahead and take up the advisory body comments, and that often sheds some important light on the schedule and the desires of our different advisory bodies, which, which helps with council discussion. All right. <clears throat> Just pause for a moment to see if there are any burning questions, but I don't, I don't see any hands. So we will start to take up the advisory bodies. We'll start with the ecosystem work group, Yvonne de Renier. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the council. Thank you for your patience with me as I went through various unmutings. So uh, the ecosystem work group I'll be working from EWG report one under agenda item F7A, the ecosystem work group report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. So I will just start by saying that the ecosystem work group submitted this report to the advanced briefing book and that kind of uh, turned out to not be helpful in this instance because we were um, behind on what was going to be in the draft June uh, agenda based on what we had heard from agenda item H2 at the last meeting. So with that, members of the ecosystem work group listened to the council's meeting planning discussion during the March 2023 meeting and noted the question of whether a standalone agenda item would be needed at either the June or September 2023 council meetings to discuss possible workshops hosted by the Nature Conservancy per their offer at the March meeting in support of Fishery Ecosystem Plan Initiative 4. After listening to council discussion and conferring by email, the EWG does not believe a standalone agenda item to scope workshops is necessary for the June council meeting. If the council is interested in an update from our May 15 and 17 meeting, the EWG could submit a short report under the workload planning agenda item in June. This would allow the council to consider the Nature Conservancy's request for the council to commit to participating in or co-sponsoring the workshops and to discuss the council workload associated with the workshops and the schedule of when they might occur. If the council is not interested in receiving a June EWG report, we would report out on our May meeting under the ecosystem agenda item already scheduled for September. Also, 
The National Marine Fisheries Service noted in March that federal staff participating in the council process cannot receive travel support from the council or other outside sources and would most likely not be available to participate in these workshops before September 30th. For this and other reasons, for example, stock assessment review panels for ground fish assessments happening over the summer, if the council decides to participate in or co-sponsor the suggested workshops, the EWG would prefer that the workshops be held after September. And so uh, we had discussed supplying a supplemental report and I was urged to extemporize instead um, the change that uh, happened between our submission of that report and the um, the council's arrival to the council meeting was that the June agenda, draft June agenda now says an FEP initiative update, which uh, is different from what they had proposed at the March meeting, which was a discussion of the possibility of TNC workshops. So I will just say that um, we are equally not in favor of a full initiative update in June. There were a lot of extremely detailed and extraordinarily helpful comments from the council's many advisory bodies at the March council meeting on the FEP initiative. And um, we are sorting through those and thinking about how to address the different and various comments and um, don't support having, uh, you know, requiring the council's advisory bodies to think about and comment on the initiative again in June, we're just not gonna have enough information for them to comment on. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Yvonne, <clears throat> for the report and your input. Looking around to see if there are any questions on the EWG report and update. And I'm not seeing any hands, thank you very much. We'll hear now from the ground fish management team, Whitney Roberts. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Grelnick, members of the council. For the record, my name is Whitney Roberts, and I'll be reading ground fish management team report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning, agenda item F7. The ground fish management team reviewed the draft year at a glance and the draft June agenda contained in the advanced briefing book, as well as the status of ongoing projects and offers the following for consideration by the Pacific Fishery Management Council. Regarding the June agenda, the GM notes, GMT notes that there are eight ground fish, one halibut and three to four administrative items that the GMT will be tracking and potentially writing statements for in June. This meeting will be very busy for the team, but we think that the agenda items are well placed and we have no suggestions on moving items. The GMT appreciates that we are scheduled to start meeting on June 21st and recommends the council schedule the GMT for a day long pre meeting webinar to front load items ahead of the meeting. With regard to upcoming meetings, the GMT anticipates attending outside of council meetings. The GMT notes that little has changed from table one in our supplemental GMT report one from March 2023 except for the potential addition of a Sablefish update assessment review meeting on August 28 to 29, 2023. This review is dependent on council action under G6 at this meeting. The GMT also may potentially schedule an October 2023 work session, depending on workload needs associated with harvest specifications and management measures. Regarding the year at a glance, the GMT supports an in-person format for the team at the September and November council meetings as outlined in attachment three. We typically provide a GMT year at a glance at each meeting to provide recommendations on whether to unshade or move certain items from the council YAG, as shown in Table 1. The GMT's recommendations provided in Table 1 are based on the council YAG in the briefing book at the time of writing this report and are not based on any assumptions about whether certain items will be moved based on council action, for example, Sablefish gear switching. In final action, if final action changes the outlook of certain items, the GMT will provide an updated GMT YAG at the June council meeting. As noted in the situation summary for agenda item F1 of this meeting, an additional agenda item for equity and environmental justice may be scheduled for the latter part of this year or early next year. The GMT sees merit in scheduling this in order to move forward with developing a shared understanding of EEJ in the council process, including the potential development of training materials and resources. 
The GMT also seeks council and or council staff guidance on what is expected of the GMT to support the various upcoming scoping items, namely limited entry fixed gear follow on package scheduled for June 2023, the trawl cat share program and intersector allocation review scheduled for September 2023, and phase two stock definitions complexes scheduled for November 2023. And below in table one, um, again, is the GMT recommendations for the year at a glance relative to ground fish items only. Um, and you can see that our main recommendations are um, to remove workload and new management measures update from the September 2023 uh, agenda. Um, the rationale behind that is that we are currently uh, scheduled to take up phase two of stock definitions um, in the fall, as well as start specs um, and beginning the limited entry fixed gear follow on package. Um, so we didn't see a need to have that one scheduled in September. Um, we uh, recommend unshading sable fish gear switching PPA and FPA for June and November respectively, but um, recognize now of course that the updated year at a glance in the council briefing book um, reflects uh, the subsequent council action um, on gear switching. We also recommend unshading stock definitions complexes scoping for November 2023, um, as well as limited entry fixed gear follow on and fixed gear marking ROA and PPA scheduled for March 2024. Um, and with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Whitney. Are there questions on the GMT report? Well, thank you for the detailed report and detailed suggestions, but I'm not seeing any hands here. So thank you, Whitney. <clears throat> we'll now have the SSC and we'll invite back up Jason Scheffler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to read from agenda item F7A, Supplemental SSC Report 1, April 2023, Scientific and Statistical Committee Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. The Scientific and Statistical Committee discussed workload planning and has the following updates to its March 2023 statement under this agenda item. The SSC recommends holding its June, September, and November meetings in person. The Pacific Mackerel Stock Assessment Review Panel will be held April 11 to 13, 2023 at the Southwest Fishery Science Center in La Jolla, California, with Dr. Andre Punt as chair and with participation from the SSC CPS subcommittee members, Dr. Teresa So and Chris Free, the CPS management team, CPS advisory subpanel, and Dr. Joseph Powers from the Center of Independent Experts. The STAR panel is planned as an in-person review meeting with web broadcast to allow for remote public comment. The Western Groundfish Conference will be held April 24 to 28, 2023 in Juneau, Alaska. Several SSC members are likely to attend. The SSC recommends holding a groundfish methodology review as a webinar on May 9th, 2023 to review the Sablefish trip limit model. Dr. Cameron Spear will chair the meeting with participation by SSC Economics and Groundfish Subcommittee members and representatives from the GMT and GAP. The SSC Economics Subcommittee recommends holding a meeting to review the comparative cost study for the West Coast Groundfish Trawl Catch Share Program on May 11th, 2023 as a webinar. Dr. Cameron Spear will chair the meeting with participation by the SSC Economic Subcommittee members and the Council's consultant, Daryl Brennan. The SSC will participate in three star panels for groundfish assessments in June and July of 2023, with participation from the SSC, GMT, GAP, and CIE participants yet to be determined. The SSC proposes star panels be in-person review meetings with web broadcasts to allow for remote public comment. Groundfish Star Panel 1 for Copper Rockfish in California, Short Spine Thorny Head, and Rex Soul will be held June 5 to 9, 2023 in Seattle, Washington, with Dr. Jason Schaffler as chair. Groundfish Star Panel 2 for Black Rockfish will be held July 10 to 14, 2023 in Santa Cruz, California, with Dr. John Budrick as chair. 
Groundfish Star Panel 3 for Petrale Sole and Canary Rockfish will be held July 24 to 28, 2023 in Seattle, Washington with Dr. John Field as chair. The SSC recommends holding the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee meetings to prepare specs recommendations in August 2023 as webinars. The SSC recommends two meetings with the first held on August 14 to 15, 2023 to address the first two star panels as well as catch only projections. And the second on August 28 to 29, 2023 to address the third star panel and any outstanding items, including the potential stable fish assessment update, both with participation from the ground fish subcommittee members and representatives from the GMT and GAP. The SSC Ecosystem Based Management Subcommittee recommends scheduling a meeting with the Ecosystem Work Group and the Ecosystem Advisory Subpanel to review the new Fishery Ecosystem Plan Initiative as a webinar in August or September of 2023. The SSC will participate in the Groundfish Mop Up Panel if needed September 25 to 29, 2023 at a place to be determined with participation from the Groundfish Subcommittee members, the GMT and GAP. The SSC recommends holding a salmon methodology review in October 2023 with participation from the SSC Salmon Subcommittee, the Salmon Technical Team, and the Model Evaluation Work Group at a time and place to be determined. The SSC CPS Subcommittee recommends holding a meeting in fall of 2023 to review accepted practices guidelines for CPS stock assessments with participation from the CPS MT and the CPS AS. The Council Coordinating Committee Scientific Coordination Subcommittee meeting, SCS8, will be hosted by the New England Fishery Management Council and will be held in the summer of 2024 with a date and location yet to be determined. At least two members from the PFMC SSC are expected to attend. The SSC recommends participation in the next Sablefish Management Strategy Evaluation Workshop in 2024 at a time and place to be determined with participation from the SSC Groundfish Subcommittee, the GMT and the GAP, and possibly the SSC Economic Subcommittee. The SSC proposes holding a workshop to develop alternative harvest control rules for Pacific spiny dogfish in 2024 at a time and place to be determined. And that concludes the SSC statement. All right, thank you very much. Are there questions on the SSC uh, report, Heather Holm? Thank you, Chair Grillnick. Thank you for the SSC report. Uh, my question is about the um, recommendation for this economic um, subcommittee to meet with uh, Daryl Brannon on the um, trawl catch share program review. And I just wondered if the SSC talked about including the gap in that meeting. I don't recall if the gap was included, but we would welcome the gaps participation. Fantastic, thank you. Further questions on the SSC report? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much. <clears throat> we have a gap report. Susan Chambers, welcome. Good morning, Chair Gorelnik and council members. Uh, thank you. Um, my name is Susan Chambers and I will be reading from agenda item F7A, supplemental gap report on future council meeting agenda and workload planning. The Ground Fish Advisory subpanel reviewed the documents under this agenda item and offers the following comments. Uh, June 2023. Referencing the draft June agenda, the gap suggests the following. Uh, gear switching. Retain the schedule for gear switching, unshade for June, <clears throat> with selection of a preliminary preferred alternative in June 2023 and selection of a final preferred alternative in November. Doing so will avoid overlap with other ground fish heavy items such as biennial harvest specifications in March and April. <clears throat> as noted in the GMT Supplemental Report 1 <clears throat> under Agenda Item G5, gear switching. Furthermore, it would allow the National Marine Fisheries Service time to address any concerns or complications 
while writing the regulations for implementation on January 1st, 2026. <clears throat> Scoping a long-term Pacific halibut catch sharing plan and commercial fishery regulation changes. <clears throat> the GAP has discussed potential changes to the Pacific halibut fisheries now that management of the Area 2A fisheries have been transferred from the IPHC to the National Marine Fisheries Service. Additionally, the GAP is aware that there is an interest in considering substantive changes to the catch sharing plan due to changes in stock abundance and range in Area 2A. The GAP would appreciate guidance from the Council about how to proceed, for example, preliminary guidance about the scope of potential action and purpose and need and getting this prior to the June meeting would be helpful. <clears throat> uh, year at a glance. Referencing the draft year at a glance schedule, the GAP recommends scheduling a scientific and statistical committee ground fish subcommittee workshop to analyze potential closed area data gathering of large spatial closures. The GAP suggests conducting this workshop as soon as possible in order to have the workshop results in time to be incorporated into the next stock assessment cycle in 2025 to 2026. For reference, please see the SSC's March 2023 ground fish subcommittee report under agenda item F6, final assessment methodologies. Other items for consideration, in-person meetings. The GAP thanks the council and staff for proposing GAP in-person meetings in both September and November as outlined in supplemental attachment three. As the GAP has noted under prior agenda items, meeting in person is preferable and creates better interpersonal communications, especially when discussing complex or difficult topics. I would like to note that our statement was uh, produced prior to the supplemental June agenda and year to glance schedules uh, in the briefing book. So our, some of our recommendations may be out of date pending, you know, council discussion, especially on gear switching. And uh, one last comment, since this is the last agenda item of the day, the GAP would like to thank Dr. Braby for her work on furthering fisheries management uh, based on science as part of her work on the council. And Mr. Chair, with that, uh, that concludes my report and I'm happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much. Susan's for the report. I have a hand, Carolyn McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Susan, for the, the report. Just one question relative to the um, long-term Pacific halibut catch sharing plan section in the GAP report. Um, the last sentence uh, is looking for some council guidance to how to proceed to scope some action. And I just wanted to <clears throat> clarify if that last sentence was suggesting a, a pre- a uh, June webinar uh, discussion, like a formal discussion, or and what what venue or vehicle were you looking for the guidance um, in in anticipation of June? Did you have any discussion about that? Uh, through the chair, Ms. McKnight, um, we did not have that specific discussion about a webinar, but we did have some general discussion that a webinar would probably be necessary prior to the June meeting to get some briefings in advance uh, for items on, for ground fish items on the agenda in June. So that could certainly be part of that webinar if that would be helpful. And you know we could be flexible on that, but that would be appreciated, I think. Thank you, Susan, for that clarification. I do appreciate that. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Further questions on the GAP report? and I'm not seeing any other hands. So thank you very much, Susan. We'll hear from the Salmon technical team. Michael Farrell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, council members. I'll be referring to agenda item F7A, STT report on workload planning. The STT discussed future workload here at the April uh, Pacific Council meeting and reviewed the preliminary year at a glance and a summary of potential STT work for the year um, follows in this statement. Uh, number one, conservation objectives. 
The STT anticipates participation in work associated with development of new conservation objectives for Sacramento and Klamath Falls Chinook. The meeting schedules and workload associated with these efforts will become more defined following the June 2023 Council meeting. However, it's likely that the STT participation in a Klamath River Falls Chinook interim conservation objective for a period following dam removal will begin shortly after June, the June meeting, given that interim goals would be needed for the 2024 fishery planning process. Next one is a Sacramento River Falls Chinook age, age structured assessment. An agenda item on the on Sacramento Falls Chinook age structured assessment is at on the year at a glance for the June 2023 council meeting. The development of an age structure assessment has been identified as a priority for some time, and the STT would be interested in further discussion on the prioritization level of this work. Rebuilding plans. Queets River Spring Summer Chinook uh, meet the criteria for overfish status in 2023, and the STT anticipates several meetings and work associated with the development of the rebuilding plan which is required to be completed within a year from the stock being declared overfished by NIMS. Additionally, Sacramento River Falls Chinook are currently at risk of approaching an overfish condition and may require the development of a rebuilding plan in 2024. Methodology review. Five salmon methodology review topics were identified by the STT, SSC, and MU. The council gave guidance to bring each of those topics to the October methodology review meeting acknowledging that a progress report on these five projects will occur at the September 2023 council meeting. The STT has primary or secondary responsibility for developing four of the methodology review items. Sankoho. The STT and MU developed a scoping document in September 2022 on potential improvements for forecasting ocean fishery exploitation rates. The list of projects was tiered by uh, one, work that could be completed now given existing information, Two, further work that could be taken up after uh, the projects uh, just described. And three, projects that would be that would need additional data before they could be undertaken. Council discussed the scoping document at this meeting, but no tasks were assigned to the STT. This topic could come up again at the June 2023 meeting, and there may be additional sunk tasks for the STT later in the year. Amending the uh, SAM and FMP. The STT anticipates a potential amendment to the salmon FMP to clarify Southern resident killer whale language. The STT is also interested in taking some time to review the current FMP and provide housekeeping edits where needed. Pacific Salmon Commission um, obligations. Some members of the STT have obligations within the PSC process. Meeting and travel obligations for this work range from two to 10 weeks annually, depending on the PSC duties of the individual STT members and development of preseason reports. The STT will be developing stock assessment of fishery evaluation document for the FMP, also known as the Review of Ocean Fisheries, and three additional reports that constitute the environmental assessment for the annual ocean salmon fishery regulations from January through April on an annual basis. And that completes the uh, STT statement. All right, thank you, Mike. Are there questions of Mike? Uh, Merrick Burden has his hand up and then Vice Chair Hassemer, Merrick. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Michael, for uh, that very informative report. Um, I, th I think a lot of us are uh, looking at uh, the fairly heavy uh, salmon workload and are curious uh, to understand more about the SDT's capacity. Um, and so in your statement, there are a couple of things that come to light right away um, as I go down it. One, if I look at the SRFC age structured assessment, the STT um, indicates you would be interested in further discussion on the prioritization level of this work. So that raises a question for me, which is uh, whether the STT is trying to flag for the council that you are coming to the edge of your capacity here and uh, you would like the council to uh, discuss uh, prioritizing this in relation to others. Uh, and perhaps even moving it. Uh, I may be reading between the lines there, but uh, that's that's a question for you. And then the related question is, if this were to remain on the June agenda, uh, what does the STT imagine it could take up between now and then? So hopefully that question is clear enough. 
Thank you, Mr. Burnin. I'll, uh, I kind of halfway forgot your first question, um, <laughs> I think, uh, but I, I will just say about this this topic, the STT has um, discussed this, um, in particular the California folks on the STT um, for some time, and there's been a desire to do this um, almost you know, since we developed the Sacramento Index in 2008. Um, and it's just it, it just hasn't risen to the top um, quite yet. And there, there's there's some reason for that. There's capacity and workload issues within the STT and in with with you know in my office and uh, as well as uh, with the state of California. And so I, I'm not sure if that's um, helpful. Um, and for the second part of your question, um, I'm sorry. I, I'm going to need <laughs> a little help with this. What you, you, the second part of your question was? Um, sure. Yeah. Happy to clarify. Uh, thinking about the time between now and June, um, if the SDT were to uh, have this on your agenda in June, what do you imagine you would be able to do between now and that time? Thank you for the clarification. Yes. Uh, I think there's, uh, the, we would probably be limited to trying to figure out what it would take, whether the data are sufficient to um, do this work right now and uh, some uh, discussions about how we would be able to implement this on an annual basis should the work actually be done to, um, you know, do the coding of a, an age structured assessment. I think that's probably um, the limit of what we could do before Jan June. Further questions? Vice Chair Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Dr. O'Farrell. On the rebuilding plans, Queets River Springs Summer Chinook, they met the criteria for overfished. Uh, I apologize. I don't remember if they've officially been declared. So a, a question, I guess, for you is if they were declared, when the, did that one-year clock start? If they haven't been, then maybe the question is to NIMS. Um, when might that clock start, just to get a sense of how that impacts the STT workload? Thank you, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, the, um, uh, my understanding is they have not officially been declared overfished, and I suppose I would look to NIMS to, on the timeline for that. Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thank you. Um, they have not been declared yet. So protected timeline would be probably around September this year, which would give the SCT, I think, another year to develop the rebuilding plan. All right, thank you. <clears throat> Further questions on the STT report? All right, you're off the hook. Thanks, Mike. Uh, we have one more report, the Habitat Committee. I'm not sure who's giving that report, but someone will speak up. Corey, uh, I, this is Corey Green on the line. Hey, can you hear me? Hey, Corey, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the council. I'll be reading agenda item F7A, Supplemental HC Report 1, Habitat Committee Report on Future Council Meeting Agenda and Workload Planning. The Habitat Committee discussed the June Pacific Fishery Management Council meeting set for Vancouver, Washington. The HD requests to meet for two days, June 21st and 22nd, instead of one due to several potential items that may be included on the HC's agenda, in addition to items currently on the Council's June agenda. These would require substantial additional time. Uh, potential release of the draft Oregon wind energy areas, potential actions related to the Office of National Marine Sanctuaries dry dock restoration plan, potential release of proposed Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary draft documents, such as the notice of proposed rulemaking draft management plan and draft environmental impact st statement, as well as the Lower Columbia River dredge materials maintenance plan. In addition, the HC proposes tentatively planning a half-day virtual meeting in late May or early June to discuss information related to draft Oregon wind energy areas should they be announced prior to the June council meeting. 
Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Corey. Are there questions on the Habitat Committee report? I'm not seeing any hands. Thank you very much, Corey. Thank you. Uh, that completes reports and takes us to public comment. I believe we have one person, Gwei Kirchner. Welcome, Gwei. Uh, hello, Mr. Chair. Um, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Good morning. Oh, okay, thank you. Good morning. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair um, and council members. Um, I will be a very quick. Um, I um, submitted a, a public comment letter um, that uh, should have been in your briefing book, but um, I think in in less listening to uh, the EWG report and some conversations that I thought it would be helpful to um, to think about uh, what an update on um, from the EWG on um, initiative for work in May would would look like and because um, I think that's uh, maybe been a, a spot that you know people can envision uh, much different things of what an update would look like and so in my mind um, that update would be something like, Here's a summary of the work that the EWG um, was able to accomplish in May. Here's a summary of the work that um, they are going to tackle between uh, May and September. And here's a summary of the things that would need to happen after September um, to fulfill the, the council's uh, guidance that was provided last month. Um, so it, I don't think, in my mind, it, when I'm thinking of the update and when I mentioned the update in my letter, that that was um, kind of the update that I was envisioning. So not, you know, a big full report of anything. And I think, um, you know, if the, what's in the, the proposed June agenda for the, the half an hour of, of a, you know, a distinct agenda item. Um, to me, that is like, that is great. Um, having the, a, such a report like that come in through um, future council meeting agenda and workload planning uh, would be good. Um, uh, other things that I've heard, such as, you know, including it as an information report, I don't think would be um, as useful as the, the council tends to not be able to take those up um, and, and have any any discussion or, or look beyond what's just written into the, the uh, information report in the briefing book. Um, and um, I really do think that um, it would that the, the council um, asked for and would um, really value getting that kind of an update that I mentioned in June for, you know, figuring out what, what do we do um, in this next phase of, of getting that work done. Uh, so I will leave that there and I can take any questions. All right, thank you very much, Goy. Thanks for your written comment and your testimony. See if there are any questions from the council members on your testimony. Thank you very much, Gwei. So that concludes public comment and takes us to our task of going through the agenda and making any changes to the drafts that are before us. Typically, that's something that's led by the executive director, but since he's not in the room with us, I will do my best to direct traffic, but I'll leave it to the executive director to take over here and then I will um, call on folks as they raise their hands. So go ahead, Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, thank you to all the advisory bodies who are able to provide input. It's always very uh, constructive and helpful for formulating uh, our thinking and uh, for us as staff getting the insights that uh, are necessary to make sure we can balance workload and timing and things of that nature. 
um, maybe just a couple of things to help reorient you all before we uh, have a discussion here. Um, so first, just to reorient you to the uh, June agenda. Um, starting off on Wednesday, uh, we do have a variety of um, advisory bodies beginning to meet. Uh, we did hear from the Habitat mm -hmm. Committee that they would prefer to have two days. Um, and so that would mean adding a meeting for them on Thursday. Uh, I believe that can be accommodated um, if the council desires that. Um, Moving through uh, the uh, June agenda, uh, just to reiterate, we did have, we are proposing to strike the workload and new management measures under Groundfish. Um, and we do have uh, that June uh, item shaded under G2, the SAC fall uh, age structured assessment. Um, it's quite late in the day to still have a shaded item. I realized that uh, that was uh, there because of our concern over salmon Workload matters, uh, we did hear a bit of a discussion here um, just a few minutes ago. Um, let's see, turning over to the YAG, um, there are a few issues that we discussed, um, none of which I really caused me to highlight anything new that I already have not called out for you. Uh, let me just pause here and look this over for a second just to be sure. The one thing to potentially note is that in June, um, we do have some uncertainty around the marine planning item uh, and discussions that uh, Carrie Griffin and I have had with BOEM. Uh, we are anticipating that BOEM will release the Oregon wind energy areas. I believe I've got that right. Anyway, the next step in their process uh, in, a, in time for the June meeting. So that could be a large uh, marine planning item um, and as the Habitat Committee pointed out, we are still awaiting word on the Chumash Sanctuary designation. Um, and so depending on the timing of that process, uh, we quickly run out of time. We are already out of time on the June agenda. So um, that is a bit of a wild card sitting out there. Um, moving through September, um, there's nothing new that I flagged for myself. Um, I think I will go ahead and stop there, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I think that would be an appropriate time to take up council discussion. All right, I will uh, look for hands for suggestions, questions, comments on the agenda items before us. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Gromick. I'll just start with one that um, Merrick mentioned just a second ago, and that is um, supporting the Habitat Committee's request for adding a second day um, to the June Council agenda. Okay. And maybe while I have the mic, I'll, I'll um, touch back on the question that I asked of the um, SSC relative to the May 11th uh, economic meeting that they're um, recommending with Daryl Brannon and support that when that meeting, or if the council supports that meeting, that when it is noticed that it also includes an invitation to the GMT and the GAP to participate in that discussion, I think that'd be valuable. Um, that's what I've got for now. Thank you. All right, thank you. Caroline McKnight. <clears throat> um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Heather. I, I would echo adding a second day for the Habitat Committee seems prudent given um, some of the things that we are expect to be coming to us in June. Um, to jump around a little bit here for June, um, I, I think it's fair to say that I would support the strikeout to remove the ground fish workload and new management measures as it is as shown on the, the, the newest attachment. Um, in addition, I, um, I do want to ask, a, I guess, a clarifying question that, that may be more, most appropriate for council staff relative to the proposed um, H3, uh, the gear switching or the initial IPPA for June. Um, I understood that the 
<clears throat> changes to the motion this morning were not intended to change the overall workload, but I just wanted to verify that um, a selection of even an initial PPA in June um, is intended to be possible and there will be time for council staff to provide analysis given all the actions we took this week. Um, so it's kind of a question um, more about it, should this be a check-in versus an initial PPA? I just want to verify that that can be accommodated. Merrick. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you for the question, Ms. Uh, McKnight. Um, yeah, that's a the the issue here with the IPPA as we've been terming it. Um, the the action earlier today doesn't affect our thinking about striving for that in June. Uh, what we have in mind for June is uh, to uh, commit to uh, making a decision in terms of the. Um, I'm going to try to carefully use my words here. Uh, make a decision in terms of the philosophical approach that the council wants to take to this matter. And so is it by that, I mean, is it a quota pound approach? Is it a quota share approach? Is it something else? And commit to making that kind of a decision. Uh, after that's made, uh, Jim and Jesse are then able to do uh, analysis of the, you know, all the different permutations and combinations of the different elements and design features within that decision. Right now, there is simply too much to analyze. Uh, I, I can't remember the actual number, but at one point, Jesse counted all the different combinations and permutations, and we literally have hundreds of alternatives. <laughs> so uh, the IPA is intended to uh, select one of the approaches, the big picture questions, and from that, that'll enable us to make some headway into the analysis, which will set up what is thought of as, or being described as the second stage PPA, which is sort of the more traditional PPA in the way that we're used to thinking of it. Hopefully that answers your question, but if not, happy to elaborate. Um, th thanks, Mark. It does. I just want to make sure for the purposes of, of the June Council agenda and the public's interpretation of that, um, there, there's some level of understanding as to what that, that means, since it is sort of a newer way to, to describe um, something that we're doing. So I, I'm, I'm happy to leave it on June and as it is, but just wanted to have that conversation. So thank you for that. Um, if, if I may, Mr. Chairman, a, a few other comments? Of course. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> just a few other observations across the June agenda. Um, I'd be supportive um, in line with the EWG's recommendations to remove the uh, FEP Initiative 4 update um, to a later time um, when they can participate effectively. Um, I, I would be supportive of that given um, all of their, their comments. Um, and then relative to G2, the Sacker Fall um, Age Structured Assessment being shaded, um, I, I definitely uh, appreciated the conversation with the STT and the STT report um, that shows that there are some limitation in time um, availability for the STT and noting that there are some um, noted workload constraints. Um, I, I would be supportive of removing that item as well from the June agenda. Um, I think I'll, I'll pause there and, and see if there's other comments, but thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you, Caroline. Uh, Heather Hall and then Lynn Mattis. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to um, allow, uh, build on the discussion that Caroline started relative to the ecosystem working group and there not being a need for a standalone agenda item, but I, I want to um, match that up with what we heard from TNC and GUE and their need to have some some input from that May webinar uh, that the system working group. And I think I've heard both um, GUE and Yvonne say they could provide an update. Uh, it didn't necessarily need to be under its own agenda item, but if that could be provided maybe under future council meeting and agenda workload planning um, 
that would give TNC what they needed to plan for these uh, fall webinars. So I want to make sure that if if folks want to remove that agenda item, that we still leave room for that input to TNC on the agenda somewhere. And maybe while I'm thinking about it too, I just the the agenda item one there is only 30 minutes, and I just wonder if it would be easier to think about on the second day of the meeting than under future meeting planning. <laughs> but um, as long as as long as the input uh, is provided, I think that's the most important point I wanted to raise here on that. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Lynn Metis. Thank you, Chair Gorelnik. Uh, Heather hit on what I was gonna respond to on the ecosystem work group report. I think uh, there's a desire that we do get some feedback somewhere and it seemed like the good compromise might be the workload planning. Additionally, um, I have received a message from Dr. Braby that two and a half hours for marine planning in June is probably a minimum. I'm sure we can eat up that extra half hour on the 23rd with marine planning. Yes, we've also expanded in day last, but <laughs> uh, Merrick Burden. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thinking specifically here about um, the ecosystem FEP EWG update, um, I am I'm sitting here trying to uh, trying to think through how to accommodate uh, what both Heather and Lynn mentioned about uh, trying to accommodate the TNC request for future guidance. I I would find it um, I think a little bit awkward to take an ecosystem report on, well, let me back up. Um, what I would envision for the EWG update is an update on their May webinars that are being planned. Um, I would find it a little awkward to take that up under future council meeting planning. I would propose that if the EWG is capable of doing this, that a short informational report is provided and then we can reference that when we take up future council meeting planning uh, and we talk about the TNC workshops and things of that nature. I just, I can anticipate that if we have a EWG report on May webinars under future council meeting planning, that that, that creates a different kind of discussion than the one that we're looking to have under that agenda item. Um, but I do think if we prime our future council meeting agenda planning discussion with that informational report, we're better able to talk about how to integrate with the TNC workshop proposal. Hopefully that makes some sense. Okay, um, Caroline, your hand is up. And now it's down. Uh, Heather Hall. Thank you, uh, Chair Gronlick, and thank you, Merrick. I that makes sense to me. I want to um, just appreciate um, the ecosystem working group saying it's too soon for a full initiative update and um, appreciate the TNC's guidance on just a brief summary from the May webinar, the work that's coming up over the summer, and then what would happen after September is what they need to, to get their work done. So that narrow focused report sounds great to me. Thank you. Sounds like a good solution. Lynn Metis. Uh, on a slightly different topic, unless... Yeah, I think we should move on to a different topic. Unless Corey, I think, maybe is trying to get our attention to on this topic. I'm sorry. Corey. It's okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to briefly speak to this before we move on. Um, I appreciate the conversation. Agree with what's been said. Um, I do have some concerns. Um, I, I heard Merrick talk about this being, um, you know, in response to the webinars as opposed to sort of an initiative for update, which I, I agree with. Um, it was my understanding that we would potentially get some feedback on what happened at those webinars and there'd be an option for the council and the advisory body to provide some input uh, to help 
kind of design and help prioritize the rest of work that goes on over the rest of the summer. So there may be some additional value. Um, my understanding of an informational report is that there just wouldn't be that opportunity for be for feedback. Um, but I might be incorrect on that. Just trying to reflect on thinking about, we just don't want to put too much under workload planning. <laughs> um, trying to be respectful of that. Merrick Burden. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Corey, for the question. Um, I, I believe, uh, Ms. Reddings, your question gets back to um, the discussion in March and the original rationale for putting this on the agenda as its own designated item. Um, and so as I rewind my memory back to that time, uh, there was some discussion about having a 30 minute update to the council um, that was fairly narrow and would allow for a, a bit of a discussion, but there was a desire to keep it um, tight and um, that that would then provide some uh, understanding that would make its way into um, future council meeting agenda and workload planning. Um, you're correct. If we do have this as an informational report, that exchange, uh, the opportunity for exchange is not there. Um, uh, however, I, I still remain uh, concerned about having that report come forward and the exchange come forward under C8 on the last day of the council meeting. I think it, I think it is essentially two different agenda topics um, at once. And so um, I'm not sure what the, what the wishes are of the council here, but I think the clear pathways forward for me are either to have it as a informational report or try to keep it on the agenda as scheduled um, try to keep it very tidy um, and uh, have the C8 item uh, be its own item, if that makes sense. Corey. Thanks, Merrick. Um, I would agree with you. My understanding of where we came away from in March and to keep the 30 minute update being very tight and tidy. Um, I, I guess my preference hearing what you just said and reflecting would be to keep the 30 minute agenda item, um, keep it short, um, but have the opportunity for a short discussion. And if any of our advisory bodies want to weigh in, they can. All right, I'm seeing some nodding of heads around that. Um, so I think that that does resolve that issue. Hopefully, uh, Mr. Burden agrees. Merrick, your, your hand is up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I meant to put it down, but I can't see the head nodding. So uh, what I'm taking away is that um, the council would like to retain the FEP initiative EWG update on Friday for 30 minutes. We'd have a brief, what I would imagine is a brief summary from uh, the EWG uh, in the briefing book on that matter. And um, I don't anticipate the EWG going around to all the advisory bodies, but uh, the advisory bodies would be welcome to offer up any comments if they have them. Is that consistent with the head nodding that's happening in the room? It is indeed. Okay, thank you. All right, now we'll go back to Lynn Mattis. Uh, thank you, Chair Gronick. Uh, this is in regards to something else Ms. McKnight brought up about the SRFC age structured assessment. And I apologize, I don't speak salmon, so I'm not fully sure what that means. But um, a message I got from John North was that Oregon doesn't see a need to have G2 on the June agenda, since our understanding is that it is too early to have an informed discussion on this topic. So we consider this a lower priority given the other tasks that need to be addressed. And I believe that's in line with uh, what Caroline was saying, that this is maybe not the time for that. Thank you. All right, so let's drill down on that. Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thanks. Um, to that point, I understand that and, and are okay if you want to remove this from the agenda, but, but I do want to note um, this task has been repeatedly noted by the STT and the SSC is important. It was a foundational recommendation in the last rebuilding plan um, related to improvements in our understanding of the stock and the development of improved forecasting and management tools. So I would hope that um, if you remove that as its own individual agenda item, that 
you could still have some sort of discussion on this uh, in what is the previous agenda item, so G1, um, as you're relating to the, the, the Falchnook, um, the Sacramento River Falchnook conservation objective scoping, uh, and at least have some discussions there, including um, how it might be considered if there is a work group created that's that's focused on the conservation objective or any um, technical form that might precede that effort. I, I do think there is some overlap there. So hopefully there could be at least some discussion as it's related to the conservation objective in G1 if you remove G2. There is an excess there after all. So there's uh What about G2? It seems like there's an, there's an interest in removing it, but not abandoning the topic altogether. And if we remove it from the June agenda, do we move it somewhere else on the year to glance? So Merrick Burden followed by Caroline McKnight. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I think it would be helpful. Uh, it might be helpful for the council if I outlined what how I see G1 proceeding after June and so as we discussed the other day <coughs> excuse me um, we will be coming back uh, to the council with a, a paper that we'll work on with NIMS and CDFW about these conservation objectives and I think there is uh, a very high probability that we will want to treat SRFC and KRFC as two distinct agenda items going forward after June. Just the nature of the conservation questions between the two are very different. Uh, when we think of it that way, I think Mr. Wolf's comment here a minute ago uh, is uh, very pertinent and that we would be thinking about the SRFC um, conservation objectives and the scoping of it and the development of it as incorporating perhaps the age structured assessment effort. So I can see those two coming together after we get through June. Uh, and as I look into my murky crystal ball, that's what becomes apparent to me. And maybe that helps. Caroline McKnight. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And <clears throat> thank you, Merrick. You said it um, far better than I could or would have. Um, and thank you, Ryan, for your comments. Um, I, I think there, there is a lot of um, important work that will come of this. Um, it's just a little too premature at this time. So discussion relative to it under G1 as appropriate in June um, is very reasonable. Um, and then what comes of that, I think, might give us a better indication where SRFC age structure um, discussion should go on the YAG um, at a later date, you know, when we get to June, if that made sense. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Looking for further hands. Lynn Mattis. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, just want to bring up the, in the GAP report, they requested some specific guidance on how to proceed on the halibut scoping item. Um, I know the GMT has also requested some guidance on some, some scoping items. So there may at some point need to be some further guidance or discussion on what scoping means and who's responsible for what, just in general. But in particular for the halibut agenda item, it may be good, uh, depending on scheduling for the gap, to have some sort of conference call or webinar well in advance of the June meeting where hopefully NIPS staff and or council staff can start to start to set the stage for them as to what this agenda item will entail, what the sideboards may be, what they may not be, so that when they get to June, they can have uh, focused discussions on what all this agenda item is. I know um, Brett Weedoff has been working with the GAP and has had some preliminary discussions with them and they've started thinking about this, but are really interested in some additional guidance on how to proceed with this. Thank you. Thank you. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Lynn. You read my mind. That was the next uh, agenda item I was also headed for. Um, I, I think in uh, reviewing the gap report under this agenda item and asking the question specifically, 
I think a pre-webinar before June would be very helpful. Um, and leading up to that, it would be extremely helpful to understand um, how the definition of long-term um, is being used uh, versus short-term or our other standing September, November agenda items under halibut. Um, discussions have been happening along in the gap here those last few meetings relative to making allocation changes to the CSP. And we want to make sure that um, that long-term doesn't preclude that uh, kind of allocation change from happening um, and, and understanding what, what can be accomplished in these next few um, meetings will be very important. So um, I, I would ask the question now, like what, what does long-term mean? What does that, what, what is defined as long-term, but I don't believe we have Josh available. Um, but I, I, I agree with Lynn that having, having um, set that out ahead of time would be, is very important. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Caroline. Looking for further hands, Merrick Burden. Um, yeah, I would like to actually turn to uh, Ms. Ames and ask her to uh, comment on this halibut discussion. I think she's just having a hard time raising her hand. Ms. Ames. Thank you, Chair Girl, Nick, and, and thanks for the questions, Lynn and Caroline. So the, uh, the language in the year at a glance referencing long-term is simply to signal that it is unlikely that changes that come out of this process would be able to be implemented in 2024. So recall the catch sharing plan, you know, identifies kind of minor changes that can be done in a two council meeting process being September and November. And those changes can be implemented the following year. Uh, here, uh, we're signaling that, that because we're not clear the scope of the item, the scope of the changes that you envision, we're flagging that uh, the timeline for implementation is not the shorter term 2024. With regard to uh, the scope of this item, you know, we really would be looking for the council to tell us, NIMPS and council staff, what sort of changes you're envisioning. If you're looking for allocation changes, what is the scope of those changes? If you're looking to implement, uh, you know, the enforcement consultant recommendation, recommendations for the commercial fisheries, which had to do with the uh, VMS, for example, you know, those sorts of things, understanding what you are uh, interested to see in the materials for the June discussion would be helpful. All right, thanks for that, Kelly. Before we continue discussion on the YAG, um, let's make sure we've got our June um, agenda nailed down. And I, I will ask Merrick Burden to uh, recap where he thinks we are and and then we can capture anything further the council has on that agenda. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I've captured a few things from this discussion, um, very much appreciated. So uh, one, I did see support for adding a day for the Habitat Committee. So we'd be looking to do that on Thursday, June 22nd. Um, there was some talk on Friday of the uh, FEP initiative, uh, talk about moving that around. And at the end of the day, uh, we, elected to keep that on the agenda, focus on a, a tight agenda item uh, topic. Um, there were a couple of discussions. One, one I, I did take to heart uh, Ms. Mattis's comment that marine planning, two and a half hours, uh, we'd probably be lucky to stick with that if, uh, if any of the Oregon issues or the Chumash issues or anything come to light. Um, and so as I look out through the rest of the week, uh, I believe we did land on striking the SRFC age structured assessment, which adds an hour to the day. And so what I'd be looking to do is uh, perhaps spend two hours on gear switching on Friday and five on Sunday, Ooh. and then uh, add some more time for marine planning on Friday uh, with that trade off. So that, that's something I'd be looking to do in consultation with uh, other staff, of course. 
So um, that's where I believe we've landed on June. Uh, but if I missed something, please let me know. I'm going to look and see if we've missed anything. Uh, Caroline McKnight. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. My, my comment was in response to Kelly's um, Pacific Halibut comment. So I just want to, I guess I could make sure that somebody didn't have a follow up for Merrick on June. <clears throat> All right, so we'll come right back to you, Caroline. So I'm not seeing any other hands with regard to June. So, um, well, maybe, maybe not. Lynn Mattis. Uh, sorry, uh, Chair. This does directly relate to June, um, not the, the agenda specifically. I think we're good there. The GMT asked for some very specific guidance on prioritization, and I just wanted to give them a quick overview of what I think. Um, I, I don't think EM implementation is something that GMT will need to comment on. The H4 harvest specifications and management measures planning, I believe the majority of that work will be council staff and NIMP staff outlining the timeline and process. And I don't think at this time the GMT should worry about the halibut long-term agenda item. At some point, they may get pulled in due to some ground fish nexuses with that, but I don't think they should be, be worrying about that one at this time. So those are just a couple of items to hopefully help focus um, the, the GMT on their work as they go forward. So thank you for allowing me that opportunity. All right, thank you. Uh, Ryan Wolf. Thanks, just very quick, Merrick, you, I think you said it when you explained your vision for G1 a while back, but I didn't hear it in the summary, but just to clarify too, that there would be, even if you strike the H structure to segment for Sac River Falls, there would still be some uh, discussion related to that in the conservation objective agenda item. Thanks. Okay, and I'll just go back to Merrick to yeah. see if yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I believe we've captured everything. And just in response to uh, Mr. Wolf's comment, yes, that's consistent with my thinking is that we would, um, you know, in this paper looking forward about how we're going to achieve these uh, conservation objectives for these two stocks, uh, I imagine the age structured assessment being part of the SRFC discussion. Um, so hopefully that addresses that, that comment. <laughs> All right, unless there's something else for the June agenda, we'll go back to the AG and Caroline has had her hand up. So go ahead, Caroline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, so in, in response, uh, Kelly, to your comments, um, uh, you did, that answered my question, thank you. I think then that, that answer supports um, my suggestion for there to be a pre-June webinar where um, GAP members could bring forward um, their specific type of proposal for allocation changes. And at that time, it can be determined whether it fits most appropriately under uh, a three meeting long-term or a more short-term two meeting planning that then um, doesn't put them in a position where they get to the June meeting and they haven't brought something forward that did in fact need three meeting. I, if that makes sense, I think that having that webinar ahead of time gives everybody the, the, um, the full opportunity to know where their proposal might land and then proceed accordingly. So thank you. Lynn Mattis, then Ryan Wolf. Uh, Good setup because my question may actually be one for Mr. Wolf. On the year at a glance, um, with the sample fish gear switching, it, if we do the IPPA, which to me sounds like a beer in June, and then we don't do a PPA until November and FPA in March, what would that do to the timeline for implementation? I, I know a lot of our public in the gap had really wanted us to follow that September be done in November so that this could then be in place by January 1, 2025. I, I believe that was the date. Um, not doing P, uh, FPA until March, what does that do to the timeline for implementation? Ryan. 
<laughs> yeah, thanks. I think that's fine, right? I think we had said, I mean, I guess it depends on what your FPA is um, with that caveat in place, right? We had said if your FPA is done by March, um, that still allows us to meet that timeline of January 2025. I appreciate the clarification. Thank you. And Ryan, go ahead. Sorry, 2026. <laughs> That's right. All right, further discussion, suggestions on the year at a glance. Ryan Wolf. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, I have a, a number of things on the year at a glance, uh, just to flag for folks. Um, I'll kind of go by FMP here. I um, don't have anything on CPS for ground fish. Um, we would uh, support eliminating workload and new management measure update uh, in September as well. Um, we've, we just did that in March. Uh, we won't have the ability to take on, I think, new workload until the next one is slated for March 2024. Um, we would recommend uh, potentially putting a shaded um, uh, range of alternatives there for the tier follow-on actions and gear marking. Um, not 100% sure we'll, we'll get to um, ROA scoping, and, and we have ROA PPA in March, and, and so I think it might, at least for this point, just to put a shaded um agenda item in september where we could either refine or, or develop the roa potentially at that point uh, we'd also support um unshading the uh, stock definitions um uh, phase two uh, as well as um unshading uh what's the In September, they, oh, I don't actually see it here. There's, oh, sorry, it's under other, I just consider it related to ground fish. The Office of National Marine Sanctuaries check in. Um, we have heard from the sanctuaries that they'll be ready, they believe, for scoping by September. Um, and then on salmon, um, I think it would be helpful um, to add. Uh, an agenda item, I believe, for November um, on, on a couple things. We, in particular, um, the three-year reviews for the LCN and Thule matrices, as well as the five-year review of the Sacramento uh, Winter Run uh, Chinook Framework. Just as a reminder, our biological opinions do require periodic reports to the council about the performance of those harvest control rules for those stocks. So um, that would be good for... Uh, adding to the November agenda. Uh, and then it also might be helpful to have a, another Klamath Dam update in March of 2024, um, both uh, to supplement any discussion of interim management measures uh, should the council decide to form a work group, um, but also because the first dam, as you heard from Jim Simide, is scheduled to be removed in July 2023 and the drawdowns in the remain of 2024. So just might be at least something to put on the ag just to keep track of. Uh, and then finally, uh, just a small um, clarification, the way the um, EEJ regional implementation is, is on for September, just to clarify that that put all, or assuming the council is interested, that is also when we would have a draft regional geographic strategic plan as well. So I, I think you could just combine that into into the same agenda item, and it's just a matter of wording there. And I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Heather Hall. Thank you, Chair Grilnick. I'm sorry, Ryan, could you repeat what you said about the LE fixed gear follow-on action that's shaded for March? Yeah, so I'm not suggesting anything on the March one. Uh, what I'm suggesting is that it would likely be challenging um, to develop a full range of alternatives for the items currently slated to be scoped in June as a part of that, so that maybe having a September uh, shaded agenda item for ROA only. I mean, so that would still keep the March PPA item. It would just allow at least the potential for us to have an agenda item in September if we needed to either initially develop an ROA or refine anything that came out of the scoping, that's all. 
Thank you. I, I appreciate and support that idea. Thank you. Merrick Burden. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, Ryan, for those comments. And I, I'm sorry, I, I lost you there after a couple of them. And so I'm, <laughs> I'm unfortunately going to ask you to back up a little bit. What I captured was uh, you you all support striking the September groundfish workload and new management, management measures update. I uh, just captured uh, the earmarking ROA in September. Uh, there were a couple of other groundfish items, one about unshading stock definitions. I wasn't sure what that was about. There might have been one or two other things, and I didn't adequately capture your November salmon suggestion. Yeah, thank you, Merrick. Um, no, we're just supporting, I think, the, I can't remember what the report was, but there was a recommendation to unshade the phase two stock definitions uh, scoping schedule for November. And I'm just noting that NIMS supports that. The council wants to unshade that now. Um, and then for salmon, it was to add to the November agenda item, add to November agenda, excuse me, uh, the um, three-year reviews of the LCN and Thule matrices, as well as the five-year performance review of the Sacramento winter run framework um, and these. Um, this is in relation to NIMS biological opinions, which require those periodic reports to the council about the performance of those harvest control rules. Um, so I think those could all be incorporated in a, a November agenda item and happy to work with you offline on how that's noticed. Merrick, do you have further questions there? Uh, no, thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, looking for further suggestions, comments on the year to glance, Lynn Mattis. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, under the CPS agenda items, there was a request to have an EMSY workshop at some point. I don't believe there was any guidance as to when. Um, I was just asked to bring this up so that it didn't fall off the table. Not sure where it would be tentatively scheduled, but that that is something there is interest in having within the next year, preferably before next April when uh, the sardine harvest specifications come up again. Thank you. Caroline McKnight. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just uh, um, to touch back on Ryan's comments, um, I would support also I think you said removing the workload and new management measure update from September, um, given the heavy workload associated with stock assessment um, work in September. I think that's um, appropriate in addition to the very thorough job we did um, earlier this year on that item. Um, and also um, support unshading the phase two stock definitions. In addition to adding, I believe you said, and a potential ROA for the um, LE fixed gear follow on action. I, I so essentially, I think I'm affirming all the things you said relative to ground fish um, in support of the same thing. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks. Thank you, Caroline. Ryan Wolf. Yeah, thanks. I just I wanted to respond to Ms. Battis's uh, request regarding this, but you must why not, I guess it wasn't a specific request, but I do want to note, um, you know, we've had some additional discussions with our science centers and, and, and I don't think we will be ready to discuss things like that or, or overall scientific priorities uh, within the scope of the current um, year at a glance, um, uh, at least not before June of 2024. Um, and, especially given the timing of the new benchmark assessment, which is scheduled for April of 2024, uh, work on EMSY is unlikely to occur um, between November of 2023 and June of 2024. Uh, additionally, the assessment process and the outcomes of that benchmark assessment are gonna be valuable information and evaluation of sardine research priorities. So, so if we are gonna schedule a council discussion, NIMS strongly feels it would benefit for having that after the benchmark assessment on sardines is completed in 2024. All right, <clears throat> thank you, Ryan. Further input on the year at a glance. 
Well, Merrick, I'm not seeing any hands here or online, so would you, would you please uh, recap where you believe we are in the year to glance? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I think this was a helpful discussion. Um, let's see, I captured a few things. Uh, starting with September, uh, I heard suggestion and support for striking the workload and new management measures update under ground fish. Uh, I heard suggestion and support for adding the limited entry fixed gear follow on and gear marking a range of alternative uh, item that would be shaded. Uh, and then Mr. Wolf also noted uh, under other on September that we should also make sure we make note of the geographic strategic plan and suggested that be combined with the EEJ regional implementation item. Let's see, moving down through November, um, there was a suggestion and support for unshading the phase two stock definitions. Uh, Mr. Wolf made note of the three-year review of LCN and Thule and the five-year review of uh, the Sacramento framework. There might've been another stock in there. Uh, I believe I've captured that though. And let's see, moving down through March, a uh, suggestion to add a Klamath Dam update in March, um, giving the timing at which the dams on the Klamath are scheduled to come out. Uh, then there was this recent talk about the uh, CPS EMSY item. Uh, I'm inclined to leave that off the YAG at the moment, but uh, I, I imagine that will come up again over the coming months about how to best take that one up. But I plan to leave that off the YAG for the moment. That's what I have, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, if I've missed anything, please let me know. All right. This is your opportunity. Any final comments, suggestions for the year to glance? Or on the June agenda? I'm not seeing any hands here, Merrick Burden. So what say you on this agenda item? I believe you've completed your action on this agenda item, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right, thanks very much. And unless someone has wants to bring back another agenda item. There's only one matter left for us here today. Uh, Vice Chair Pete Hassemer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Even though my flight is very late this evening, I move we adjourn now. Seconded by Heather Hall. All those in favor say aye. 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 Extensions. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you everyone for the hard work this week. Travel safely and be healthy. And we'll see you in Vancouver.